All right. Uh, yeah, take it away, Trish. All right. I'm just going to. OK. Good afternoon, everyone. Like, uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. I do live and work in Nelson, BC, and it's I respect the traditional territories of the Tanaha Nation, the Skylix and the Sinaix people. I do come to you today, though, from Vancouver. I am on essential business travel. I and I'm going to share some personal stuff throughout my presentation. One being, I'm in a bit of a personal crisis as I am moving my very elderly parents from Ottawa to Nelson. The COVID has not fared well for them. And so I'm halfway through this epic journey. My parents were not in very good condition when I arrived in Ottawa to pick them up uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we've got to Vancouver and we're driving to Nelson on Sunday. So I've been a bit distracted in my personal life and actually just with being a planner and understanding what COVID, the impact on us all, age-friendly, senior issues, that's all top of mind for me. So uh, I just needed to share that with you and that's kind of where I'm coming from. However, my presentation will cover my role as a community energy and emission planner in BC. I'm gonna talk about uh, transportation planning with emission reduction in mind. But my spoiler alert is I like the human health ties to energy planning. We always start with the human scale and active transportation to keep us healthy. All trips begin with a walk and we try to focus on that. And I will note the strategies for uh, regional travel to a low carbon future. Now I realize I need to share my slides. So let me just find my slideshow. Sorry, share screen. There we go. Uh, okay, and all right. You want to give me a thumbs up, Damon, that you can see my slides? Yep, looks good. Okay, thank you. Okay, walking puts time in my day. That is my mantra. And in the compact mountainous community of Nelson, BC, I use walking as my transportation and my exercise. I actually find it faster to walk. I take shortcuts. I never look for my keys or a parking spot. And I also avoid the inconvenience of gas stations and flat tires. Walking provides time to reflect and it separates work. Well, in the old days when I used to work away from my home, I could separate the work from um, home with that walk, providing that mental space. Uh, now, actually, I find walking a wonderful way when, we're, when listening to webinars or su such, often I just put the webinar into my ears and I go for walks along. We have the BNR Rails to Trails in Nelson area and I find myself very focused when I'm listening and walking. So walking does the time in my day. I also wanted to just point out in these slides that the photo shows uphill, which is the name of my neighborhood. I call it my uh, uphill advantage and I've benefited from walking uphill and <laughs> downhill over the years. Um, so I kept my legs nice and strong and, and it's been really good for my own health. We also have the waterfront pathway, a picture of that in Nelson, BC, and that's following the banks of the Kootenai Lake, uh, which is a river transportation route, it's part of the Canada Trails BC, or Canada Trails uh, project, and it's a river transportation route similar to so many trails or a piece of it. But as I noted in my question to Daniel, I would love to someday have the uh, CPR uh, be a little more friendly and somehow we have an active transportation route alongside the CPR and continue that all the way through from Castlegar to Nelson and beyond but that's kind of a dream right now. Uh, all right 
what is planning? So I'm a registered professional planning. I'm with the Canadian, so our, our national organization is Canadian Institute of Planners, and then the provincial organization is Planning Institute of BC. We all learned at planning school the definition of planning. It's the scientific, aesthetic, and orderly disposition of land, resources, facilities, and services with a view to securing the physical, economic, and social efficiency, health, and well being of urban and rural communities. Or, in other words, planners are the keeper of the process. We respect the common good. We consider the past, the present, and the future generations in the development of plans, policy, and programs. Personally, for the past 13 years, I've been doing community energy planning, which is linking land use planning to energy conservation, emission reductions, certainly being inclusive, age-friendly, and considering human health. To me, community planning is all about connections. The concepts have evolved over time, but as I said, importantly, it's about connection. Jane Jacobs is an urban planner from the 1960s, and she's quoted as streets and their sidewalks, the main public places of a city are its most vital organs. Our pathways link along the rivers of our land, Many of those links come from long ago roots of our First Nations people. And I'm a true believer of age-friendly, multi-generational, active transportation opportunities. And I will point out that corner in the bottom is my family in Ottawa a, a few years ago during better times. And, and my, my parents are in the middle there and they were always very, very active people. Uh, so, in I am a true believer of age-friendly, multi-generational, active transportation opportunities. For me, the personal journey on climate action began with Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. That put the spotlight of climate action for me. I've since worked on what we call climate mitigation plans, but more recently, we've been moving into climate adaptation and building resilience in communities. So the story of climate action in British Columbia, in 2007, the province introduced the Climate Action Charter. The agreement, local governments were to um, measure their corporate emissions, that's lead by example, show leadership and work to be carbon neutral in their operations. For community, they were to add greenhouse gas reduction targets to their planning documents, like their official community plans and their regional growth strategies. And they were to develop plans to achieve those targets. So those are the community energy plans that, I've, that I am describing through this presentation. The third piece was to build compact communities, that is to reduce sprawl and concentrate infrastructure and resources. Most, practically all of the local governments now have in BC have voluntarily signed the Climate Action Charter and in return are eligible to receive their corporate carbon tax in the form of a grant which is known as the CAREP grant. That's the Climate Action Revenue Incentive Program. More recently, uh, the province introduced Move, Commute, Connect. It's the BC strategy for a cleaner, more active transportation. It's part of the BC province of, province's Clean BC plan to build a better future for all British Columbians. And within that, uh, book there, there's its transportation design guidelines for cross government consistency. It makes it easier for communities to incorporate active transportation into their infrastructure. It's identified a number of steps that focus on improved planning, public education and awareness and safety improvements, making our communities more livable with investments in cleaner and safer transportation options. Now these community energy 
plans I've been talking about. The uh, exercise in the Kootenays, we developed them in partnership. They were funded by Fortis BC or BC Hydro, depending on the electrical utility, and the Columbia Basin Trust in our region. The resulting plans, we call them SMART, specific, S, M measurable, A achievable, R relevant, and T time-based. And though their premise is to achieve G greenhouse gas emission reductions, they also meet those official community plan targets that were required to be put into the OCPs. They link community design, planning, and health. They promote active transportation, healthy built environments, try to establish equity access and design for all ages, and focus on health promoting policy and in the environment. I'm drawing your attention to the Community Energy Association, which has been my employer for uh, the many years. Uh, if you go onto their website there, which I've identified there, they've got a, a kind of a do-it-yourself climate action planner tool right now. And uh, you can look up your own community and sort of toggle with actions that you could, you could take to kind of give, a, give an, a ballpark of what you need to do to reduce emissions in your own community. Along with the community, uh, like the Climate Action Charter, the, uh, or as part of the Climate Action Charter, I described, the province also provides data. That's the CEEI, Community Energy and Emissions Inventories, or the baseline data to motivate action in different ways. It's been said you can't manage what you don't measure, and the province provides us with that data. And we're really ahead of the other provinces in BC. In Canada, most provinces do not provide this data. So the premise for community energy planning exercise is for greenhouse gas reductions. But to help visualize, uh, I find it helps to explain it as a cost. So for example, this is the RDCK, Central Kootenai Regional District. It has a population of 60,000, an area of 22,000 kilometers squared, and a population density of 2.7 people per square kilometer. What this is saying is 22, this was the 2016 inventory, but $22 million per year is spent on energy. Most of that, most of that money is leaving the community. That means that each person spends approximately $3,800 fueling their vehicles and heating their homes. So whatever we can do to reduce uh, your energy consumption, Keeps, keeps money in your pocket. In the transportation example, by reducing emissions and vehicle use, we increase active modes and improve our health. We can walk more. Now with respect to local government policy uh, and these community energy plans, there are three key impact areas that we, we concentrate on. And the, these are, the areas that local government has some influence. So those are buildings, transportation, and waste. And we call that climate action. If you focus on community and promote compact development and active transportation. I draw your attention to another website associated with Community Energy Association, and that's the bcclimateleaders.ca. This identifies again those three categories, the three and um, some of the big moves, we call them, to um, find solutions to move your, com your community to a low carbon future. Now, why link uh, community design, planning, and health? The development of the community energy and emission plans by local governments address multiple issues climate change, climate action. The, the global climate is changing. Average temperatures are rising 
and extreme weather events, flooding and drought are more frequent. These changes affect natural and human environments, the air quality, clean water and food sources, and potentially have negative effects on our health. For mental health, the health and healthy built environment, stress, depression, mood and anxiety disorders are emerging as some of our most prevalent health impacts of our lifestyles and behaviors. Access to nature and a connection to one's community are extremely important. And in this year of the pandemic, I have to say that this is, this is really a critical piece. We need those outdoor environments to keep us sane and healthy. Chronic disease. The rate of chronic disease, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease is rising in the interior health area. Currently, one third of BC citizens live with at least one chronic disease. Management of chronic disease accounts for 80% of BC's healthcare budget and impacts quality of life. The majority of risk factors for these conditions are lifestyle related, physical inactivity, tobacco use, and unhealthy diets, poor food choices, obesity. And these are preventable or modifiable. 50% of adults and 91% of kids do not get the recommended level of physical activity. 26% of Canadian children are now overweight and obese. And those uh, figures came from Interior Health a couple of years ago for me. The aging population, uh, access and design for all ages and abilities, we call that age-friendly. As our population ages, more chances of developing chronic disease through lifestyle practice. Citizen empowerment with means to travel by providing transportation choices, all, which include the youth and the seniors who don't necessarily have driver's licenses, have, have independence and travel choices. Community planning and design can influence the choices people make and reduce the chances of developing chronic disease. Partnership. When you are doing community energy plans, be sure to include in the discussion your local government, the regional district, your health authority, First Nations, the utilities, school districts and students, Ministry of Transportation, BC Transit, Chamber of Commerce, your local trail society and cycling group and equestrian group and other community groups and your large employers. And so when we were doing the planning, uh, the community energy plans, we would invite the local stakeholders and they were truly sort of community built uh, plans. So I also think of it as how to build community and the creation of special partners. And especially during COVID, we're seeing how community is so important to us for the isolation we're feeling. Ensuring planning, ensure planning is inclusive. The principles of an age-friendly communities apply to community energy and health planning. Uh, age and one, one sort of example for uh, age-friendly communities that I often think about is curb cuts. And the curb cut in our urban areas for sidewalk is really important, not just for a wheelchair, but also for a stroller, a child learning to walk, or even a, a, a skateboard. They're, they're an important part of our fabric. We also need to involve all stakeholders. I recently learned that the apron for the curb cuts uh, in, uh, in some communities, they've started to put the apron sort of on the corner rather than perpendicular to crossing the street. They're very aesthetically pleasing these corner aprons of the curb cut. But what it actually does is it's not so friendly for a wheelchair or a blind person because it actually leads you right out to the center of the intersection rather than having the uh, crossing 
perpendicular to the street. So that's a, just a little tip that I learned about age-friendly and in, being inclusive and making sure that you know that the aesthetics of your curb cuts actually meet the needs of the people that would like to use them or need to use them. So a, a major partner in the community energy planning exercises has been interior health. Creating healthy communities, mental and social well-being during the times of COVID is especially important. The Healthy Communities team, their purpose is to take strong collective action to promote, improve and protect the health and well-being of our communities. Health professionals from the Healthy Communities program bring the population health lens to the community energy planning exercise. They advocate to optimize citizen health and well-being in their home, work, education, and recreation environments. Human health re relates directly to access to resources known as social determinants of health. That's income, secure housing, safe neighborhoods, nutritious food, recreation, education, employment, healthcare, and positive early childhood experiences. The Healthy Communities program supports local government policy, strategy, plan, and implementation in the areas of food security, active transportation, poverty reduction, affordable housing, smoke-free spaces, age-friendly communities, parks, green spaces, and recreation and of course supports the development and updates to the BC major land use planning documents like official community plans and integrated community sustainability plans or ICSPs. So concerning transportation, which is the focus for me on this, on this talk, it's um, we have this uh, planning exercise, we have this pyramid to illustrate the actions. And you start at the bottom of the pyramid and you consider trip distant reduction. So that's by creating the compact communities and reducing the need for travel through urban form and transportation demand management. We're changing behavior and this bodes well for walking. So does action two, the mode shift. That's to mode shift from cars to walking, cycling, transit. And after that, we move to the actions on vehicle efficiency and fuel switching number four to electrify uh, natural gas, biodiesel diesel for the rest of the transportation system. So for reducing greenhouse gases uh, the, in, from the transportation sector, in the rural areas, they're significantly higher than what we see in the urban areas. So in this diagram, 64% of the transportation GHGs are in rural areas in uh, urban areas. So of course, that's there's long distance between communities using factors to keep farm inside those vehicles. So 64%, as I said, of, of emissions in the rural areas are transportation. Little contact here. So this is a snapshot of an area of less than one square kilometer in downtown Vancouver. And look at those transportation choices. Neighborhoods and communities are linked in a variety of ways, providing residents of urban centers with options to reduce transportation related GHG emissions. Density and population result in opportunities specific to the urban context. And you see there, there's electric vehicle charging stations, bus routes, walking routes, uh, bike routes, sky train stations, all sorts of great transportation options. And here's the rural region. So here's, this is the example is from Fernie to Cranbrook. You don't have a lot of transportation choices to get to the nearest hospital or um, 
other things. So uh, um, I guess that's kind of self-explanatory, that big picture there. You, do, you could have a beautiful bike ride through the mountains though, but don't be discouraged because every action is important and rural, act, rural areas do offer the advantage of active rec recreation opportunities. So now I wanna go into a little bit of my story, national transportation, that's how I answer and me, and they were traveling the waterway across Canada on some of the same portages that are still in existence today and used as part of the Canada Trail and uh, the recreation opportunity and transportation routes of this country. On the other side of my family, that's my mom. My mom's side is the voyager. My dad's side was building railways. Uh, so until this great work is completed, our dominion is little more than a geographical expression. Apparently Sir John A. Macdonald, our first prime minister is quoted in the national dream, the story of building Canada's railway. And I am descendant of one of the fellows in the picture there, um, the Henry Camby. He was the engineer in charge of surveying the BC portion of Canada's na na nation building exercise in the 1870s. And here's a little picture I snapped in Ottawa this week, uh, just talking about the um, the railways that cross our country also provide links and routes for recreation and the Great Canadian Trails and the BC Trails link many of the traditional waterways and railways. And it's my national dream to add a safe, active transportation facility sharing the connections of the existing highways and railways. Hence my question about the Castlegar Nelson routing. <laughs> I just need to point out, you know, I showed my great great grandfather in the previous picture at the nation, nation um, the nation building exercise, and there I am propped up against the Fortis BC car because I had broken my leg the day before. So I did learn a lot about age friendly and uh, transportation with that broken leg because I couldn't actually drive. Uh, but I was part of the act. Although I'm an active transportation advocate, in this discussion on emissions planning and the large distances traveled in rural areas, I do need to acknowledge that following in my ancestors' footsteps 140 years later, I was on the planning team for Accelerating Kootenays, a collaborative electric vehicle region building project to electrify the Kootenay geographical expression described in the building of the railway. So electric vehicles offer a cleaner fuel choice. And if you go back to that pyramid example I had, it's near the top. Uh, they offer a cleaner fuel choice to reduce emissions on transportation, because I do admit we can't walk everywhere, but EVs are not the solution alone. They're still cars. We need to keep active, and transportation and when we can get back on transit, you know, other sort of more communal uh, forms of transportation in mind. The term built environment refers to the human made or modified physical surroundings in which people live, work and play. As I've already been talking about, the physical, mental, and social health of people are directly affected by how a community is planned and built and the service and resources that are provided. Community energy plans provide direction to develop active transportation plans, improve walking infrastructure, and promote a healthy lifestyle, all while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Community energy plans engage the community, support healthy transportation choices, and develop a collaborative, inclusive community resilience. What began as a plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through community involvement, partnership, innovation, and resolution develops into an age-friendly and connected rural community. 
a little bit more about active transportation and my love of that. There's the Rideau Canal sometime a couple of, I don't know, a week ago or so uh, in Ottawa. Uh, nice, back, nice bike and walking route. Here's the structure. Remember the petition period I showed you? Talk about behavior first. Do not forget community design with appealing walking infrastructure. In theory, most people will walk a short distance. Sidewalks and pedestrian links are still important. Here's uh, the trail staircase that links residents to the industry and make it faster to walk to work or climb with appealing inf walking infrastructure. I think I already said that. Now, one of the main healthy transportation planning principle is to prioritize facilities for walking and cycling. People choose to walk or cycle more often when there are comfortable buffers from traffic and sidewalks, intersections and crossings are perceived to be safe and accessible and people can travel relatively directly to their destination. Pointing back, this was a, a Nelson um, stats. Nelson is a historic city surveyed in the 1890s to what we call the grid system. It's now has a population of about 10,000 and an area of 7.2 square kilometers. The historic layout and circumstance of the mountain and lake boundaries shaped its compact design and created a walkable community. And I find these stats on walking to work impressive, but reasonable. Walking is viable and in Nelson, as many communities, parking is a premium. The mountain, and if you remember, I talked about my uphill neighborhood, is certainly my barrier for cycling. <laughs> and uh, transit, we do have that in Nelson, though it's adequate, it is a privilege and a privilege to have the service it suffers from an infrequent service and short distances. So for those in town, it can be faster to walk. Uh, health evidence shows an increase in positive mental health, positive early childhood development, and increased physical activity when residents feel safe, included, and socially connected in their community. Walkability empowers people, physical activity, work school attendance and social interaction. It is a huge positive in terms of the social determinants of health and supports positive mental health. And now I'm just gonna work into a couple of success stories uh, with especially with our partners, Interior Health. And at one time they had some, what they called Plan H funding which were, uh, and so there was some projects recently built around the interior of BC that were spurred out of community energy planning exercise and uh, produced some really great examples. Uh, many of the communities had major barriers dividing their community. So this is an example in Sparwood where a river runs through it it bisects the community and isolates the residential neighborhoods. Now with this pedestrian bridge, there is a walkability and a connection never felt before. And for some of those uh, people living on the other side, it is faster to walk into town than to drive around. The bridge is a healthy built environment feature because it contributes to a complete compact and connected community. It is safer, more direct route for people to walk or cycle between their home and daily destinations, especially for children, youth, and seniors. This is an example of Clearwater, where it's divided by Highway 5, which was a major north-south connector and a regional transport traffic. Kids could not safely walk to school. This new highway roundabout is like I say, that's talk about traffic calming because those are two major highways. Uh, the, this new roundabout uh, provides a livable, connected, walkable community. 
So you need to think outside the box and change it up. And out of decreased emission ideas comes walkability. I got a few slides here about SALMO, with a little bit more of a case study, same, same example. Uh, an action stemming from SALMO's community planning is the construction of a pedestrian bridge over the SALMO River. SALMO is located in the central Kootenai. It's a small community with a population of about 1,100. And many healthy planning principles have economic, social, and environmental co-benefits. They completed their integrated community sustainability planning, ICSP process. They called it Sustainable SALMO. And it was using the outcomes of their um, community energy plan or strategic energy and emissions plans, KEEP, we were calling them, to inform this overarching community plan. So as the examples of Clearwater and Spirewood showed also, this map shows how the bridge in Salmo connects uh, the two schools and the residential area with the downtown. As the community becomes more connected in the physical environment, there are also more opportunities for people to interact as they walk or cycle to their community. This is especially important for people who are socially isolated. And here's the opening day of the volunteer built 6th street, street Pedestrian Bridge on Canada Day 2017. It was expedited by the discussion at their community energy planning workshop in early 2016. The Salmo residents can now walk the loop and I trust walking is putting time in their days and reducing the cost of driving and community and emissions. So for these, for these SKEEP exercise or community energy plan exercise, one message is to reduce uh, of greenhouse gas reductions and carbon tax is to build community. The result is the co-benefits of active transportation and the healthy population. Community energy plans provide a useful lesson that allies and partners can be almost anyone because health is everyone's common interest. So partnering with local governments strengthens the physical activity message with, community, with interior health. I just want to point out that this picture is pre-COVID, uh, but look at the importance of just social interaction uh, on our senior population. So um, some of the health outcomes is uh, active with active transportation, which reduces energy use and emissions, also improves health. At the level of the population, these planning principles have been shown to increase physical activity and social interaction and decrease unintentional, unintentional accidents. People have healthier body weights, less respiratory illnesses, improve mental health and live longer with an overall improved quality of life. One of the main healthy transportation planning principles is to prioritize facilities for walking and cycling. People choose to walk or cycle more often when there are comfortable buffers from traffic and sidewalks, intersections and crossings are perceived to be safe and accessible. People can travel relatively directly to their destination. Another part of health outcomes, in addition, the ability to move safely and efficiently around the community without requiring a vehicle decreases the cost of living and provides more opportunities for affordable housing, healthy food, physical recreation and education and employment, where there are less social barriers, overall health improves. Just wanted to point out this is an American study, but it's the financial case for walking and the compact uh, development as walking relates to the cost to citizens. Uh, so for this, in this example, we note that um, in, sort of in urban areas, uh, 
the cost to live carless certainly cuts down on an individual's cost of living. Compact development is cost effective and walkable. And uh, just to finish up here, I promise we're almost done. I truly believe in my work as a community energy planner. By addressing climate change, we are actually building healthy communities, appreciating human scale, and remembering to include the walking infrastructure and cross country skiing there. With the health lens linked to the energy lens, our communities will become more connected and healthy. And in conclusion, the climate summit joke with the questions of the presenter pointing out livable cities, healthy, healthy population, et cetera. The question is, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Well, in BC, it's been 14 years since the introduction of the Climate Action Charter, and I believe we've made progress. Awareness has been built. Local governments believe it's the right thing to do, and they have influence. Communities are working to meet their reduction targets and inspire their populations to be more active. Community collaboration is key. Partnerships with the province and utilities to support the development of community energy plans and rails and trails and active transportation are unique to each place. The plans are impetus for developing infrastructure to walk the talk and a healthy, active, and engaged community results. And thank you very much. That is my presentation. I know it's not quite as long as it was supposed to be, but it felt pretty long to me. <laughs> and um, I'm, I guess there, I could look at the chat or maybe Damon, if you wanna help me out here, I, we can have some questions. There yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah, I just, I just want to start by saying thank you so much and you know this is so important the the planning side and the planning perspective because um yeah i mean building communities that are accessible for everyone is it's crucial for all populations and then also making it um you know more equitable because not everyone can afford vehicles or um you know uh, other other forms of transportation so making sure that everything's walk friendly is crucial. So um, personally, I live, I live on the unceded territory of the Silk in Kelowna, BC. And uh, yeah, I'm right in, you know, smack dab in the middle of downtown. And it's like constantly, there's construction going on and all this other stuff. And it can be a little bit irritating um, as someone who, you know, needs to drive to get to the grocery store and oh, this road is closed and stuff like that. But then I, I find out, oh, no, they're building this beautiful nice separate bike path and I, I'm just so glad and and now I, I pass those same areas and it's I constantly see people out or you know moms with strollers or and uh, whole families you know you got the little kid on the tricycle and it's, it's just so great to see that in my own community so oh, um, yeah. yes and it, it's it's from you know planners such as yourself that are making these you know more inclusive communities and I'm just yeah uh, thank you so much for kind of bringing in in this per perspective and um yeah I, i'm uh I'll, I'll help you kind of go through the chat i know we had a question um pretty quite early and it was someone asking for a link um and uh i think it was right before in your slides you had the link for bc climate leaders and it was before that oh um, okay i i can um Maybe at the end of this, I can share my, I'm happy to share this slide deck with people and uh, I, I can, um, I can provide, or I can also try to type it out in the chat at the end. So, uh, but it, I think if you Google BC climate leaders or also community energy association, which uh, is the organization I worked for, for many years, I've, I've just recently left, but um, either those, but I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that um, I put those links into the chat at some point. Okay, perfect. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I think it was, uh, it was where 
people could type in their the communities in which they lived. I, oh, okay. Yeah. You know what? I guess I can go back here. Sorry, I don't want to make you see oh, sick, no but I'll put that I'll put that as my uh, slide for a moment, and you can copy it down. So that's the climate leaders, but it was it was this it was one, that one climate yeah. yeah, and that's Community Energy Association is my former employer, and yeah, if you if you you yeah. You can kind Perfect. of play around with that tool for your community. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll put the community energy link in the chat now. Um, that person can kind of, they might have to cycle through some, some stuff, but uh, I'm sure they will find it. Okay. Um, oh, and someone's asking, can you put up the picture of the, the roundabout again? There is oh, a, yeah, in Clearwater. There is that? a lively debate about roundabouts. Um, oh, and how much okay. People like them. The yeah, job. that's and I, I that is not my slide. That's from Interior Health. Uh, so I, I'm not personally familiar with that one, but that was. And it and it's from it, this picture was taken about 2017. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah. If anyone has any questions, feel free. To, to put them in the chat. Someone said they were trapped in the inner lane before. In this area. <laughs> <laughs> I got quite good at them when I was just, as I've told you all, I was in Ottawa on my essential travel and yeah, they had quite a few there and I got quite good at them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not many here, um, which is unfortunate, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, definitely something to get to get good at for, you know, if you're ever doing a trip to Europe or something where, you know, roundabout <laughs> everywhere. So um, yeah, uh, you know, drive around town. If you have a roundabout, get used to it. So, you know. <laughs> um, and, you know, there actually are, my understanding is they are emission reducers because you don't have to kind of the stop and the start. And mm -hmm. Yeah, and the time that you're kind of, you know, sitting at the red light and, and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just easier for everyone, for sure. Um, someone asked, how, how would pedestrians cross at this roundabout? Uh, do they sim simply stand at the thick lines and, and traffic stops or how would that work? Again, it's not my slide, but that, that would be my understanding. And, that, and it just, because yes, it would be those thick lines would be the, the pedestrian crossings. I mean, it's still, it's still, um, you know, not not as safe as an overpass or an underpass, but I, just the way the lines are there and it's it's kind of traffic calmed. But again, I, I probably shouldn't have used a slide that's not really mine, but uh, that was an example given to me. And um, sorry, you people are more familiar with Clearwater. I'll we'll have to answer that question. Yeah, no worries. Um, someone just asked. Uh, how is the electric car, the fast or supercharger network coming to the Kootenays? Oh, well, I, uh, I can talk to accelerate Kootenays. We, we can fill up some time here. Uh, but, you know, I was trying to focus on active transportation. But yeah, um, so in a couple of years ago, we launched Accelerate Kootenays, which was $1.5 million project funded by the utilities, um, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, so many. We put in, uh, let me just remember my facts here, 31 level two chargers and 13 fast chargers in the Kootenays because prior to about I think it's about 2019. You know what? I can actually send you a link. I'll do that. Um, Pia, I, I wrote an article for the Planning Institute of BC on Accelerate Kootenays just recently, and it has a little bit more of the facts. So I'll, I'll send that to you and you can share that out. Uh, but I'll just try to briefly uh, out, outline it. So originally, you couldn't drive an electric car in the Kootenays because there was nowhere to charge it. So if you were in Vancouver or somewhere else, there, it really was quite an, quite an epic journey to come to, um, to the Kootenays. 
But with Accelerate Kootenays, we were able to install all this infrastructure. So there's level and, you know, and it was modeled based on a Nissan Leaf that had a 140 kilometer range. So there's fast chargers about 140 kilometers apart and there's uh, level two chargers in different communities. Some of the things about level two chargers, they're known as the, you know, the slow chargers. It takes about four to six hours to charge but those are really good community building uh, infrastructure because you would drive and you would stop and when you could go for lunch and <laughs> whatever you kind of be, it's a tourism thing, you would stop. So we located those all in, in places with amenities. So the person could go for coffee or rec you know, go on a rails to trail uh, while their car was charging. I feel like I'm a little bit madly off in all directions in the answer to this, but go oh, Google Accelerate Kootenays. There you go. That's, um, and that's going to give you, it shows the network and it shows the, um, you know, just sort of the planning process involved in, in building that network. And from that, it's, it's spurred other, um, other infrastructure. So we've got peaks to prairies now. So we're doing the same network into the Alberta. And we've got Charge North, which is an, uh, kind of from basically Kamloops in the northern regions of our, of our province. So connecting those all with an electric vehicle charging network. And I guess the last thing I want to say about that is it's universal because uh, Tesla is not, a te not all cars can use a Tesla station but Teslas can use this universal charging station that we, because again, we really wanted to make it inclusive. If you've got an EV, you don't necessarily have a Tesla. So that was a um, point there. Okay, I think I've um, rambled on about that long enough. But again, Google Accelerate Kootenays or Community Energy Association because it, we'd have all our projects linked on that. I've, uh, yeah, I put the Accelerate Kootenays link in the, in the <laughs> chat. So, um, but uh, yeah, definitely not something I've ever thought about before in terms of, you know, implementing EV chargers uh, in terms of community planning and, you know, the benefits of having a slow charger, you know, people are going to come to this community and uh, have a cup of coffee and maybe go to another, you know, local kind of small business and, and have uh, a bite to eat and go for a walk. And yeah, so I, I mean, it's, it's all interconnected with active transportation and trails, EVs and, and, uh, and chargers. So I think we have we have a couple extra questions about EVs. So sure. um, is, it always comes down to that. They're sexy people like that. I just I want to point out what you just talked about with the um, there was a mayor that I'll will remain nameless, but one of the mayors in one of the more like central communities that we had to have a fast charger in. That person did not want a fast charger because exactly to what you said, we want people to stay. We want people to enjoy mm -hmm. our community. We don't want them racing through. So I, th I thought that For was sure. funny. That was the early days of Accelerate Kootenays. But, uh... That's funny. Yeah, that, I, I mean, if I was the mayor, I'd be on the same boat. Like, no, let's keep them in. <laughs> I know we got to go beyond that mentality, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it kind of does make sense. Um, so we have a question here. Uh, how do you envision uh, electric vehicles linking adjacent Kootenai vehicles such as Meadow Creek, um, Taslow, New Denver, et cetera, as it is its transit BC is reducing their services? So sorry, so the question is EVs over transit? Because uh, because we actually have, uh, Caslow was mentioned there, there is, we have electric vehicle charging stations in Caslow. Um, I actually personally know some EV owners in Caslow that are, that use their EV exclusively from Caslow and they go into the Okanagan a lot and even in, uh, I, I want to point out that uh, EVs most charging is done at home. So if you are living in Meadow Creek or um, Caslow, in general, you would be keeping your vehicle charged in your own driveway. And the EV infrastructure is, is really meant for tourism and for, you know, when you're, when you're at the other end. But when you start from home, you would start charged 
but I, I'm sorry, Damon, I'm not quite clear on the question with respect yeah, to trans. I, I think they, they added a, a, another kind of comment to the end. They meant in conjunction with transit BC. So how okay. are, uh, yeah, how do you see in the Kootenays um, EV vehicles um, being used in conjunction with uh, transit? Okay, I'm gonna get you seasick again and I'm gonna go to my pyramid. So hold on people. Yep, no worries. <laughs> there we go. So this is sort of the principles of uh, planning transportation. And we talk, so we talk about compact communities at the bottom, you're trying to reduce the trips that you need to do and then mode shift. And at the very top, what they say is electrify what's re all the rest. So all those trips, so you're trying to get people out of their personal cars and into more uh, fuel efficient vehicles and more, um, so, you know, transit, like, you know, there is um, a lot of work being done on um, vehicle, fleet vehicles becoming either um, compressed natural gas or renewable natural gas as their fuel or electrification. I mean, electric buses is not a new thing. So that is certainly a possibility. I, I, can't, I can't speak to exactly when that's going to happen in Meadow Creek, but um, uh, you know, there, there is opportunity. Uh, you know, on an aside, and you know, I've talked about a few dreams, but many of you probably know Sandon, and Sandon has become a little bit of a, I don't know, a graveyard. It's not a good word, but there's all those old electric buses that are being stored there. And I know that there is a dream that maybe they could be refurbished and um, put back on the road. So, you know, I'm not. I'm not saying that's going to happen today, <laughs> but hey, it's all, you know, the national dream. It's all open to possibilities. So, you know, talk to Sandin. For sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, uh, someone commented about um, slow chargers and, and how they think that um, the slow EV chargers wouldn't make people stop at your community, which kind of makes sense as well, how the fast chargers would make people, you know, kind of feel um, more motivated to kind of stop, oh, it's just an hour, um, you know, charge up, then then they can, you know, kind of experience the local tourism of those areas. And that, yeah, for sure, that totally makes sense. Yeah, um, I can, I can just on the fast chargers. Um, so it's 20 minutes well, it all depends on the car and the amount of charging, but the fast chargers to get to an 80% full, it takes about 20 minutes is my understanding to go the full, the, the full tank, you know, it slows down. So it take, you know, might, might take like an hour for the full tank tank. Uh, but um, yeah, and it, it's evolved the experience. Uh, when EVs were first being sort of introduced to the Kootenays, it's trying to, you know, it's about, it's about the experience of driving again, you know, the Sunday drive. And so, yes, it was sort of the slow movement and, and the slow chargers, but you're right. People, people kind of want to get to A to B. So the fast chargers would be more uh, tempting, I'm sure. For sure. Um, we have another question uh, just regarding the EV chargers. Uh, okay. Do they include plugs for electric bikes and uh, wheelchairs? Yeah, I, for Accelerate Kootenays, no, that wasn't in the, but that's actually a really good point. And we'll add that to the dream list, I guess. Um, well, but my understanding with the, with electric bikes is it's just a, it would just be a, what it's known as a level, uh, level one, which is just a plug, right? So you can plug in anywhere. Uh, the answer is Accelerate Kootenays does not, is not, it's not for bikes or scooters or wheelchairs. Mostly aimed at, at uh, vehicles then. That was, yeah, that was aimed at the EV crowd, the electric vehicle. Makes sense. I mean, just, you know, dependent on, uh, 
you know, where you're going and uh, if you're commuting to, you know, Southern Alberta and you, you need to stop, like, yeah, it's, it's making it, um, you know, uh, kind of more geared towards that, that kind of um, community planning. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, but kind of on that note, um, you know, as I have said with cars, your charging is at home. So probably for your bikes and your scooters, your charging is at home, but then this might be a, a, an alert to BC trails because maybe that's where the chargers need to be on the, on the rails trails and, and the, act, the more active transportation corridors and not necessarily on the highways. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't, I can't speak much to that, but I'm sure you know, CL would, would have something to say about, um, you know, the benefits of something like that. I know we're just trying to get it so that, um, you know, we're, we're, we don't have this continued kind of uh, competition with, with motorized users and, and non-motorized users. Oh, yeah. Um, that's yeah. a huge thing we're, we're trying to go for. But, uh, I mean, we're all for electric bikes and, um, and scooters and any, any other modes of kind of accessibility. Um, yeah. We're all for it on trails. Um, we have another question here. Uh, what do you think of turning our, our rail trail corridors into roads and its effect on our active users? The precedent by our government has occurred for 65 kilometers of rail trail out of Castlegar. Well, that's, um, I'm not, I'm not here to make political statements. Um, I will say that I do have a personal experience. I, as I've alluded to in this conversation, I am a walker and I actually, in Nelson, I've never really been all that enamored by bicycles because not only do you have to go uphill, you have to go downhill too, and that scared me more. So I, I'm not, I haven't been a cyclist. I, I'm an avid cyclist, but not in, or, you know, in flat places. But uh, it, so during COVID, we got a my husband and I got a mountain bike. And so I've been um, biking again a little bit more. And what was my, uh, my point was going to be, oh yeah. So I, I mount, I, I actually did ride from uh, the Paulson to Castlegar last summer. And I was so proud of myself and it was so, such a beautiful ride. But yeah, there were some logging trucks on there. So that was a little, um, you know, I was a, a little concerned when I was on that beautiful trail. So, I mean, personally, I would have rather they weren't, but I'm not about to advocate any further than that. Yeah, fair enough. No, there I think go. that answers the question. <laughs> um, yeah, we have lots of conversations, lots of people in our, in our chat that are uh, um, EV owners and uh, they love it okay. and you know they're talking about um you know kind of their their typical habits um and uh we have one person that says they you know they're always charging overnight on 100 110 volts which is a normal home plug and it charges overnight and it's good to go so um i guess it just depends on on kind of your commute or or um that your habits with your electric vehicle um so uh so yeah uh, good to see that lots of people are kind of making that decision and, and, uh, and choosing electric vehicles. Hmm. Oh, yeah, good. I, um, I don't, I don't have the link off hand, but something was like Kootenai EV family. Uh, that was a fellow that lives in Nelson and commuted to trail every day. And he was one of our EV ambassadors to help model the Accelerate Kootenais. And he blogs about some of his experiences and he's an engineer type. So there's lots of good data on there. I think it's Kootenai EV family. And uh, that's a good, you know, it sounds like you're, I'm, I'm not seeing the chat, but um, that might be a, a nice link for people. And actually this person that writes that blog, he had described before we had Accelerate Kootenai's, he did go to Vancouver on a trip in his Nissan Leaf 140 kilometer range and it took him four days to so it was about the journey <laughs> it wasn't a fact but just because he had to stay in a campground overnight so he could charge and things like that so yeah for sure 
Um, yeah, so I, I've linked that in the chat. You found that one? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I can't see any other questions here. Um, I guess give everyone a, a minute if they have any last questions and then uh, we can let you go. But yeah, is there anything else you'd like to, to speak about, Trish? I know you had quite a lengthy presentation, so it might just be <laughs> nice to, to have a little bit of a break, which is totally understandable. <laughs> I have to say, I've never, usually the presentations I give are um, like 20 minutes. So uh, yeah, an hour was a lot of time to fill, but uh, tried. Uh, so um, no, I don't think I have any more. I, I'm happy to um, ha give my contact information one more time. Sorry to make you seasick here. Um, that is my, I'm, I'm about to launch a uh, Danelle planning, a little planning consulting business, but at this point in time, as I've um, discovered, it's all consuming to be the caregiver of elderly people. So I think my career's on hold for a little while while I finish this move, but you're most welcome to contact me. And I, I actually am, uh, my father bought me membership to the Canadian Trail, Great Canadian Trail. So I'm a member and uh, we've always been very active in our family and I I will I'd like to uh, join your trails BC and I'm going to do a shout out to Tara who invited me to speak today and I just like really active transportation is so important to me and you know thank you for all the good work you're doing and I I would like to be connected with you so for sure yeah, no, and we really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, when, you know, when, when the time comes and you, you get uh, the planning kind of business sorted out, we'd love to shout you out on, on uh, our social media channel. So, you know, please keep us informed. I know you have my, my contact information. So, um, but uh, yeah, I just, you know, I'd, I'd really like to thank you again, Trish, for, you know, based on the current circumstances you're in, still making it out, still delivering an awesome presentation um and you know just lots of support from from people in chat um saying you know your parents are lucky to have you and best of wishes and and stuff oh, like thank that you. so um, actually that makes me thank you that's really <laughs> touching I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna stay on for a few more minutes and i'm gonna read through the chat but i i won't be able to stay for the whole um whole session today and i wish you well all and, and thanks thanks for inviting me yeah, no worries. And uh, yeah, just thanks again. And I uh, appreciate that you're interested in becoming a member and uh, shout out, you know, ourselves, uh, Trails BC, if you want to help out, if you want to, you know, kind of put, put pressure on the powers to be, um, it makes a, a huge difference how many members we have, as, as CL mentioned before. So kind of joining this, this mass advocacy effort so we can continue to to vouch for AT and uh, self-propelled travel. Um, it's a, it's, you know, it's of utmost importance for us and our organization, mostly volunteer based. So um, we would really appreciate it. And um, yeah, thanks again, Trish. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free to stick around and, and read the chat. I know you've been going through your slides and everything. And so I, I totally understand that, um, yeah, you'd, you'd like to see what people are saying. So, um, we uh, we're currently on break until uh, three o'clock is our is our next presentation. So we got about um, forty five minutes here. If you you want a quick bite to eat or let the dog out for a walk or or what have you. Um, so uh, yeah yeah. Um, see everyone at three o'clock. Okay. Goodbye all. Thank you. Thanks again. Yeah, my granddaughter Jenny. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, ready to go? Yeah. Um, OCM, uh, I'd like to introduce my seat lad, my grandmother, um, grand, uh, Ruth, Elder, respected Ruth, Elder Ruth Adams, um, to start us off in a good way with a prayer. Okay, I'm going to say a prayer in English because I don't know my language yet. So, but I have to do this for all my friends. Name the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Creator, please bless this Zoom meeting that I am on and bless each and every one that is watching, but especially bless the 
Great Blue Heron Way committee members and my family, my, my granddaughter, Jessica, who is going to do a prayer in our language because we are so um, thankful that, that we've got our young ones uh, learning their language. So dear creator, bless everyone that is watching and bless what I am going to talk about today and all of those who are listening on this Zoom. And I thank you, dear creator, for letting me stay alive to do this, which is my whole life. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, on all my relations. Um, OCM, Siam Nasiaya, Jessica Thanasqui, Talitzen Ut Swathen, Sitla, Ruth Adams, Kostanya, E. Stepson. Um, it just gives me great honor to be sitting here with my grandmother doing this work, this very important work, her legacy, her life's work that she's put in. And I would just like to say a prayer in Hunkaminam for you listening and share a song also that is called My Ancestors that I will explain after I say the prayer. Oh, and uh, what I've said in the beginning, um, welcome uh, respected family and friends. Thank you for having me. It's so good to be here. Um, I'm from Tawasan and this is my grandmother. She carries two ancestral names, <clears throat> um, which makes me so very proud. So, um, to see come true, eat seat we all are tough size. Quam quamster to squallowing squam 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 stutter. Let us pray, Creator, listen to our prayer. Thank you for bringing us together. Watch over us today and please keep us, or keep us with our work and keep our thoughts strong. Amen. And um, my grandma's asked me to share a song today. It's called My Ancestors. Um, it's actually written by, uh, created by the Kate C Youth. Um, and it's thanking the creator of the ancestors for our life, for our dreams, um, for our strengths and for the land that we stand on. So without further ado. Wanna see a fuck? Hey, oh, hey, oh, hey. When we in it. Hey, oh, hey, oh, hey. I tell Cassia the fuck. Hey, oh, hey. Thank you for having me. I am so grateful today for my granddaughter being with me on this very, very special day. And uh, my husband is from, his mother is from Staelis, and my father is from Staelis, Sasquatch country. And they do have Sasquatches that walk among them in that mountain. 
and near Harrison. And also my husband's father is from Katesy. So there are many Adams in Katesy. So, and my granddaughter says, we all look alike <laughs> in Katesy. So, and my mother is from Swasson. So it, it is, it, it's my great honor that she could be here with me to let you know that if anything happens to me that you can get a hold of Jessica or Marianne Adams to be able to handle my work if, if something happens. But I want to live to 100, so it really doesn't matter, but they are learning learning to do my work just in case I get once the virus is gone and maybe I'll have to be in many places at once so I'll be able to have my granddaughters um, take up some of my work so I just I don't I don't usually make notes but before I, I do the presentation I wanted to I wanted to um, okay Where's my notes here? Oh, green. Here we go. I wanted to say this because I wanted you all to know that I was watching last night. So watching the presentation on Thursday was very emotional for me. All that I talk about uh, relationships to each other is vindicated within these presentations. Thank you so very much. Makes my, my, me cry with happiness. My grandmother had history with Nanaimo and the Malahat on the island. Our process with getting or receiving our ancestral names takes traveling to, to to all, all, all where our relations are to get the history of our names. So we still do that today. So surviving through all the development. As an elder, I am so very proud of our ancestors who have gone through so much trying to save our land for all the next generations. Why do we still talk about stolen lands? Because Canada has not recognized us as the people of the land. All this development around us without one word of thanks for using our traditional lands. One step has been learned for government people, and thanks to Delta, they are one of them, government people to start a meeting with recognition on whose traditional land they are on. We indigenous people share our stories, our lands and our waters. Tears streaming down my face as I watched and listen to our people talking about how we live through racism that has been taught. This is why I am here today for all my friends who have put me here to tell my story. That is the committee of the Great New Heron Way. No privilege to escape politics wherever we go. The words white supremacy hurts because we do not meet a lot of people who are not, who, who do not hate us for still being alive to say, this is our traditional territory that we share with all of you. Stolen culture, stolen language, stolen lands, stolen waters too. Canada has to tell the real history, the history of us indigenous people who have been labeled, labels that taught Canada that we were and are the stu too stupid to look after ourselves and too stupid to look after our lands and waters. How do you get a sense of place? 
this is what I am about as as First Nation elder woman, as a First Nations elder woman, talking, walking on the land. Thanks, so many thanks to Trails BC for educating and fundraising for the health of all of us together. Honor the trailblazers, and that is such good words that I heard. For me, I feel like I have been welcomed to the trails of our friends on, in our traditional territory. We have relatives in Musqueam, grandma's favorite was Dominic Point. And in Lummi, my grandfather was related to John and Annie Lewis because he fished in Lummi Island. Um, reef fishing, and I was with them every summer. Family members in Staelis, the Leon family, that is my husband's mother's name, and all of the Leons there, hello to you. And the Charlies, that, that, was, that was all of the relatives who looked after me as a young woman, as a teenager, and as a child. My sister Ruby Seymour in Ladysmith, part of the Cowichans. And all my relations in Winnipeg, my first relations, first cousins in Winnipeg, who was Sharon Bocott and Joe Mathias in Squamish. They both were really, they did the treaty and they're both gone, but they were, I looked up to Joe Mathias. He, he was younger than me, but he, he did so much for the treaties here in BC. And, and he did so much. I think that's why he died so young is because it took a lot of work to get our treaty. And thanks to Kim Baird too, I can never forget her. She went through a lot to get our treaty. And, and I think that's, that's it for my notes. I only wrote those because I wanted you to know that I did listen to what was put on yesterday and was so happy to do it. So, and also to say many, many thanks to one of our committee members who does all of the communications and who is going to help me with the slides today. And that is Sandra, uh, okay. And so I guess I'll, I'll go through, I guess when I said it though, all of our relations in Astaelis and Katsi and Sawasin and on the island too, my grandmother, when we went on that trip on the island, her friend drove us and it was just like a whiz through going on the bus, but it was so important to her to, to show me around where she, she knew all about the island and that's where the name Quistania comes in. And the artwork that has been done for the Great Blue Heron Way, my, my nephew, Carl Morgan, he has the male part of the male part of that, of our ancestral names. Okay, so I thought the Malahat and the Nanaimo and I haven't been over there very much to see, to see since my grandmother brought me there, which is at least 30 years ago, because I'm, I'm 78 right now and will be in October, I'm 79, my husband is 79. But another thing about us is my husband and I have been married 60 years on April 28th. So um, we have been through quite a bit, I and my husband. Um, his, his mom and his dad broke up when he was just a, what, three, three or four years old. So, so he has not had a really great life neither. He loves his mom and his mom is gone and my mom and dad and his mom and dad are gone. But, but we are survivors. I never tell my story and want you to feel sorry for me because I am a survivor. 
and we've got four daughters, 18 grandchildren and 15 great grandchildren, which makes me really happy. So, so I, I figure even through all of the healing that we have to go through, through the trauma, and just to let you know, my father, he, he was in a residential school and, and he has had a big family and they all died. So he was the only one in Staelis. He had relatives like cousins and that, but not many more. His brothers and sisters were all dead. But my dad was in residential and then he went into the army. And when he went into the army, he lost his status. And if that wasn't enough, when the war was done, um, the government gave members that, that were in the military, gave, gave them land to live on in a house. And, but my father didn't get that. So he wasn't white enough and he wasn't Indian enough. Okay, so that's what started my family. And so I had three sisters and, and what, nine brothers. Anyway, there was 11 of us, two sets of twins, boy and a girl, boy and a girl. So I've got two brothers that have died. The oldest and the youngest have died. And, and their story was my youngest was homeless for a while because like I said, my, my mother and dad were broken up. And, and that was because of the residential school. That was really because of that, that my dad died with him, not getting any healing from that. So my family, my family has had um, trauma due to my dad. Okay, but I forgave him for the things that happened. And that took a lot for me to do. Because you love your dad and you love your mom no matter what, no matter what they do, they are your mom and dad. So that was how we were. And I, I was, uh, when I was very little, we lived in Staelis. And um, talk, one of the men that was talking was yesterday was saying, oh, what did you like? Well, we had a river right beside us where we lived in Staelis and it was a river. So you know how cold it was. So I used to go to that river in the daytime, our whole, my brother and sister who were in Ruby and, and a relative, um, Peters. Peters were their name. That's a relative of my dad. I used to go to the river and I would float down the river and see whether I could float without floating away out into the out way out to where I couldn't swim anymore. But that's what I did. Ice cold river to, to swim in in the summertime. And then we moved to DeRoche and Leon, that, that, you'll know that name, Leon LeBrew, part of my Great Blue Heron Committee. Well, I lived there for a while and went to grade six in that school. And that was pretty nice there wasn't any races in there and I thought oh things were just fine but go to high school after that move to Hatsik and all the while the thing about this was all the while in in um, Lake Eric because hey? that's where we were when I went to the DeRoche school Lake Eric there weren't many people didn't speak to us and didn't make any friends and in Hatsik it was even worse but when I went to grade eight and went to mission high school it was horrible and the racism in mission was just horrendous so bad that even now traveling through mission it gives me bad memories because hotel stopped in the hotel visiting my mom after I had my my four babies four daughters stopped there and went into this motel and they said no we we don't accept Indians here so and that was not very long ago so talk 
talking um, and knowing all of, all of the Black Lives that Matter, well, it was us too. So right in mission, they said, no, we don't accept Indians. So that was very hurtful. So that, that, that was my life and all my summers were spent with my grandmother and grandfather, Peter and Sophia Jacobs. So that was where my childhood was happy. Otherwise, my, my childhood was not very happy for my sisters and, well, two other sisters and all the brothers. And having such a big family, that was only about the five of us. My, um, my brothers, uh, Ruby, Roy, Stuart, Howard, and Mildred. Uh, we loved each other and were happy with each other. But with the racism, it wasn't very nice. But as a young one, as a teenager, I, I even got a job in a cafe in Harrison Mills. And that was when I was getting 25 cents an hour. <laughs> so, whoa, four hours and I would get a whole dollar. <laughs> so, so that that that's how I was. I I went out right away and started started to try and be a participant in the world. Eh? So that was our world, and so I wasn't going to to stop just because there were people that hated us. I said, no, I'm going to go on. And when I got that job, I was quite happy. To and my brother Stuart would would came and I would get him. A, a drink or a piece of pie or whatever. So I was, I was happy and that's my brother Stuart. And he still, still remembers that. And that was a happy time. So having, having my daughters has been great for me and my husband. Not that we, not that we have a perfect family. And this is my story. We have all of our traumas, but we are all in a healing mode right now. And Swazin is very good since we have gotten our treaty and we have our, our mall now and our industrial lands. We have, we have good staff to help us with our healing. And since I had my granddaughter on and it's hard for me to talk without getting emotional. But they're learning the language and they're learning the songs. I have my song, I, I see in Chief Dan George's song and that's, a, a, that's for all of BC. But when I heard that, I just cried and I had to learn it and I did. I learned it off a, a tape recording and got the words to it. Well, our words anyway, say. Hey? which no one else would uh, know about, but, but that's, uh, that's how I came about. And, and I was involved with the minister of the hummingbird. I can't, cannot not tell about that. And uh, she was a Cree woman, was a minister, and she was going to Vancouver, UBC. So I know a lot of people from UBC through uh, Mary Fontaine was her name and and just in case she sees us I don't want her to think that I went through all of those years without letting people know that that was some of my healing too going through I think it's 10 years with her so I know a lot of people and they remember me at the UBC in Vancouver so I did a lot of welcomes and sing, sing my Chief Dan George's song all over Vancouver and in Saskatchewan too. So going with Mary, I, I learned to, to do that. So that was a lot of healing. And I worked in the Delta Hospital for 30 years in the laundry and the linen, hey? And I started there when it first opened in the laundry. We had a hundred residents that we did to washing their clothes and delivering them back to their room. So, and, and then we had the acute 
So I went over there and did the linen, and that was heavy backbreaking work. Today they have a little cart that they hook onto the 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 linen carts, hey, and they they don't have to break their back like I did. But I was so happy to be in that job because of the residents. I faced racism there because as we we're doing our treaty, they were all Fisher and um, Fisher and farmers. farmers' wives working there. So a lot of them didn't didn't like me because I, I was always always there and I was always proud to be First Nation. So when I attacked that racism, I went, I went in to be a chairperson of our, our local union. And I became the chairperson of our health and safety committee for the hospital. And what I did there was, was good too, is that our management would use up all our health and safety hour would use it up on to telling us what they were doing and they didn't give us time to say well we're having troubles on the floors so I said no we're going to ask for a separate meeting so as I can explain what how things are going with the employees and the patients say hey, there was violence and then they had to we had to make sure that we knew about it and and to make sure that the that the management was giving, getting all of the equipment. So all of our care nurses in, in the long-term care would be getting all of their, the things that they needed so they wouldn't break their backs working for our long-term care people, hey, our, those residents. So that is how I did that. And I have to tell you, I also stood up when we had our meeting for all of the hospital employee, employees union, I stood up when OCA was going on and they had a person that came to tell our union members how awful it was that the policeman had died. So I stood up in front of all of them and said, hey, that isn't the only person that has been hurt out of OCA. So I stood up and said, Hey, think about our First Nations and Oka. Because when I watched them on TV, I said they're going to die for their land. So I did that. I stood up amongst you know, five, 5,000, our annual meeting. So I've always been looking after our people in those regards. And I also worked with a, a little Mennonite girl who was um, the, the committee that we were on was, was um, what was it now? It, it was, oh, I can't even remember now. I've got so much <laughs> to remember being 78. <laughs> <laughs> it was, anyways, it, it was working for First Nations and the Mennonite church was already working to try and help us um, um, be recognized and try to take the racism away from other people. So, so, so if I remember, I'll give you that name, but they were, that was, uh, that's another church, the Mennonite church, because they did, um, they did a book and they did a lot with helping uh, so when we were doing the residential schools, so that is my history up until now, and and so and and I also have to tell you the name steps in from Stalis is 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 a, a land where the lake lake is, and and it's part of where the and our ancestors were. Up there, you have to go into a mountain road, which is really scary because it's a logging road. So it's it's not paved; it's all rocky and it's very very narrow. Eh? So, but that I I have to say, I'm so proud of that name because uh, 
I mean, relatives in Stalis gave me that name. So it, it's very important to me. <clears throat> so, and, and I, I guess I, I have to say that, that my chief and executive, I think I've gone through two or three with my great blue heron way. So it's been 20 years at least since I've been working on this. So it is a great honor to be here. I, I can't tell you that enough, that it is a great honor to be here with the committee members who are all watching. And I will put that in the presentation that Sandra will help me with the slides with. And no, okay. Anyway, that, that is how I, I got, oh, and I have, to, I guess I, I have to tell you too that the way I started my great blue heron is is when we were doing the treaty, we had I had a friend that I met, Carol Vignali from Swanson Delta. So, oh, there we're starting. Okay, then I can start. Sandra. Yeah, thank you, Sandra, for doing this for me. I have to say that um, I feel the reason I feel honored to be here is that I'm not well. Well, I am well educated in, in doing my work, but I am not college educated. But I never let that stop me. I, I just uh, I just go go wherever. To, to do whatever I think needs to be done. So I have lived my life and going right in I, the way I started with the racism is that my friend Carol Vignali, who is one of the founders of the Great Blue Heron Way, started me off. We went to Victoria and along the way we met to the Galloping Goose signage there and I asked them, oh, which First Nations are on here? And of course, they said there was none. <laughs> so that's what I said. Oh, then you'll have to join my great blue heron with. That'll be the First Nations. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go to the next one. Yeah, next one. Next one, Sandra. Oh, okay. okay. Now this one, I'm sorry, I'm going to read this out from here. I think I will read this because it is very important. You'll be able to follow it on, on the slide. Recognition and acknowledgement of First Nation traditional territories is sacred to the ancestors and youth of today. The Great Blue Heron Way honors the people and their land, past and present by presenting these important landmarks for the history of Canada. The Great Blue Heron Way is a journey where people can safely enjoy the nature of lands and waters. The spirit of this path connects the people along the way where friendships can grow naturally. The Great Blue Heron Way honors the traditional territories of the Suas and First Nation people. The path will honor each and every traditional territory that it connects with along the way. And I think I have to tell you this story. I watch the news every morning and I watch Channel 9 CTV. And when the weather comes on, they always say Delta. And on that picture, if you would see, if you watch the news in the morning, you will see two little slits. And one is the ferry and one is the port. And there we are, Sawasan First Nation. And it makes me feel bad that they never say Swasin. And I think this is what I want people to know. Even other 
First Nations to know this, that it looks like we are a small nation and unimportant. No, we were the host nation here with our ancestors, the island people would start here to rest while going up to Staelis and Hope and all the ways up there where the Sasquatch people, our people lived, my father's people. So we were the host nation then on this side of the Fraser River. But now look, they should be saying Sawasan because in between the ferry and in between the port, this is where we all live, right on the water. And we've got our own bog there that never, nothing will ever be built on there because that's our little nature where all of our birds go. Mm -hmm. And even the fish swim in there. We've got a little park and the great Blue Heron Way boardwalk is there for all of us to enjoy. And thanks to Richard Cook, who isn't on this, but Richard Cook was a developer and he came to us and he's the first one that said, oh, Ruth, that's a great idea. And so, so that's when all of the leaseholders around us um, got the Great Blue Hair boardwalk and that they can go right to the breakwater, which is the Great Blue Heron Way, the breakwater and the boardwalk. That is so very important. But it, this is why I do this, because Sawasan First Nation is a host to the world now, and no one has ever said thank you to us or recognized us. So this is a big part of the Great Blue Heron Way that I wanted you to know. And so this, this is a great one too. I, I'm a paper woman. <laughs> I, I'm a paper woman. So I like to look at, I'm, I'm not really techno, technological person yet. I love the Zoom, hey, but my members, my, my granddaughters helped me to make sure I can get it on. And I will, I think I will read this. The Great Blue Heron Way starts at Swas on the land facing the sea, where travelers from around the Salish Sea and along the Fraser River could safely pull in their canoes. Swasson was and remains an important meeting place. The International Trade Port at Roberts Bank and the Swas and BC Ferry Terminal are located here. Ferries connect to Victoria, BC's capital, to Nanaimo on the Southern Gulf Islands. The Great Blue Heron Way helps to highlight connections of Indigenous people, peoples over thousands of years. The ancestors live here all along the pathway. The path will honor each and every traditional territory that it connects with along the way. And this, this map shows our traditional territory, which is so important. To, why? Because people say, oh, who's that little Sawasan? And they're so little, they, they, do, they can't have very much. And look at that. They've got all those houses surrounding them. But the houses surrounding us, those are, are, are um, I have to tell you this story because I've got a lot of time and I want you to know why, why I am here and why I'm going to tell you these stories along the way. That the Indian Act did a lot of awful things with us. They, they, they did not uh, recognize our traditional territory. That is why all the people think that Suwas and First Nations is just this tiny little spot in between these important ferry and the port. But no, we are not this little unimportant part. 
and the engine act gave the gave the we're called the landowners so the indian act gave the land to the men of our nation so it didn't recognize the women of our nation so that was a hurtful thing that they did because and i have to tell you the story about that about them how the men were given the land and not the women settlers who first came in and and britain i guess it would be that that uh, held their lands in canada before they gave it to the prime minister anyways they said well why are you letting the women um, be all powerful why are they why are they doing all of the work well that was the way it was done for us coast salish nations especially our nation and women did all all of the things so that is very hurtful that they gave the men and didn't tell the men to, well share it with the women of the nation so that was hurtful and i blame the government for that i don't blame the men here that didn't share it wasn't their fault so that was part of the colonialism so that's that's a story so the the ones who have fee simple land then they lease that out to all of the houses around us so and they could only do that because of the treaty so i have to say thank you to chief kim baird and our now chief ken baird her brother for for doing all of this work cuz i'm so very proud of the mall and i'll speak about that when we go through some of our slides but i had to let you know about our traditional territory and what it means to me when i say welcome to our traditional territory look at that when you look, they don't even recognize us in the port and the ferry on on the news and the weather on ctv and the other ones that 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 show the weather so i'm hoping that um I'll, i think i will put that in somewhere <laughs> that they will change that and recognize swasan weather and the swasan people next slide oh is this not a beautiful map and thank you david leon and thank you for doing this and the map and it's it just it just i said if anything if we can have the first nations on the maps and the trails that will be one great thing for me and i'll be able to die happy so just look at all of these it's it's just a wonder a wonder and and uh, Oh, again, Susan, too. He, you're all. I thank you all so very much, my the committee members, for doing this. I could not do this all by myself. I have to let you know the story of my great Blue Heron Way and the committee members. When um, and it was Carol Vignali that introduced me to all all of the committee members who have been here ever for 20 years there's sometimes that there was nothing to do and there was sometimes that we had to run and make sure we were everywhere that we could be to be advertising the great blue heron way and i have to tell you that that this is why the committee members um latched on to me and my vision because my vision was to be able to go through all of the development of today to to get first nation to first nation in today's world so so that that was the main reason my committee members have come to me and i was happy to do that because my part of this vision was recognition and acknowledgement of the traditional territories of first nations 
here in BC. It, it, that, that's, I, uh, that was my part. And, um, and the Great Blue Heron Way, this was my, being an elder and working on this. Uh, this has gone to three chiefs, so they all know about this, but they have been so busy on all of the work that they do that I continued on, and it is thanks to my Great Blue Heron Way committee members that, that I could go on with this work and get these maps that I could not do on my own, but my vision is what drives this. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a vision that brings us together, the Great Blue Heron Way, when I talk to anyone, I say this is a trail of reconciliation that will bring all the First Nations and everyone living in our traditional territories together. We can do this together to get rid of the racism that we all have to face. And when I say racism, it hurts me. The biggest part is when I went out, I, had, I went out to find out, does everyone hate us? As growing up as a child, like I said, in Mission and up there at Harrison, I, I, I tried to find friends that, that didn't hate us. So that's where Carol Vignali came in. And then she introduced me to all of our committee members. So next, next one that, that is, I'm so, so proud of this work and so proud that it's with the friends that helped to do this the climate change, oh, this is so big. And I'll let you know where we are with this, just a story to fill in that you can follow this on the Great Blue Heron Way. It's, and I will read it. But the, the big part for us is they want to have a third birth at the port. And, and for us, we're not, we don't want it to happen because it will, we're crabs, eh? This, we have salmon too. We're part of the salmon people because of where we are. We're at the mouth of the Fraser River. So the best salmon that takes its way up, way up to Hope and beyond the Fraser River where it goes, well, we get the first fish, us and, and the Musqueam and other First Nations that fish here on the Fraser River. So it is very important for us, for the salmon. But the other thing that we are left with here on Swasson, because here in Swasson, when I was a little girl, we had, we had clams and cockles and we had, and we even had oysters too, I think, and they're all gone since the ferry and the port. But we do crab fish yet and we all love our crabs and anyone that, that is invited to a meeting here at Swanson always ask, are we going to have crabs? Because we, when we have meetings, we feed everyone each and every time. That, that is what makes our meetings go well is when we eat together as First Nations and all others. Uh, um, government workers and other people that come always ask, are we going to have crabs? And they get all excited. So, and, and if the port gets its third birth, they want to move our crabs. <laughs> and I always say, well, how can, how are we going to tell the crabs that they have to move? And maybe they won't move to where we'll still be able to get them. Maybe they'll just move away and we'll never be able to have crabs anymore. So that is one of the things that were that happens to us. So that that is that, that is a big part of, of I'm I'm thinking that friends of ours can 
can help us out when when we are doing that part. And I won't talk any more about that because we've got more on our slides. But the climate change, that's part of it, though, hey? The climate change, I, I figure we've got enough, enough housing around us now and 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 we've got to if we get the third birth then that means there's going to be another probably railroad track go through and maybe they'll widen the port road and and for me as an elder i think we've got enough enough going on with our climate i don't think we can fit anymore here i think we've i think we've got enough but but the climate change is really big for us and the Great Blue Heron Way, even just along our little pathway from, from the ferry to the port and along the water, we've still got plants that our people use as medicines. Eh? And also my Great Blue Heron Way is about the Great Blue Herons. And it's about all the other little birds that come around. And we're trying to save the marine, uh, uh, the land around that our birds use. And that I can't, I, it really hurts to think that we would lose all of those birds. There's, it, it, I, when I feel bad, I go, I go outside and I listen to the birds and the great blue heron comes and eagles come and, and seagulls and, and crows, all the birds you can imagine comes here and they make me feel good. I just go outside and I, I listen to them. So I, I, that's all a big part of it, um, our, our climate, our climate change. It's, it's so bad that um, our spring and our fall, it's all mixed up now. It's all mixed up, our spring and fall and summer and winter, and we never know when it comes now. We used to know in the old days when I was with my grandparents, they would know when it's going to come and we would get the sign, see? And I have to tell you what I think with this virus. I think the earth is trying to get rid of all of us earthlings, all of us human beings, because we have um, not been good to this earth, our mother earth, we have not been good. And I think if we keep on digging and digging and taking out all, all of, all of uh, the resources, all of the resources out of our earth, then it's like, as human beings, if, if the doctor came and took out all of our liver and bladders and, and took all of our, our blood out of us, uh, how would we feel? And that's what the earth is going through, taking out all of the things that makes it an earth, all of those things, the gas, the water, and everything that we take out of the gold and then diamonds and everything that comes out of the earth i i believe that 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 the, the earth is trying to get rid of us because we have not been good to the earth and so it's saying we're losing everything and we're losing all of the animals because we're developing all of the places that animals go now around here we've lost everything we've got coyotes yet <laughs> we still have coyotes and rats and mice and rabbits <laughs> so now maybe i'll look at this i just want to tell you the stories that comes to me as i'm going through this and so you'll you'll know the reason why i am here and and want to let you know from a first nations elders point of view helping to encourage the use of active transportation that has expanded during the COVID-19 pandemic and make sure it is inclusive to youth and families in all financial circumstances. Nature, regeneration and sustainability. People exposed to wild places learn and understand the importance of varied habitat 
and healthy interlinked ecosystems, cultural awareness and education, sharing knowledge within Indigenous communities and beyond to encourage pride and bring about meaningful reconciliation, sharing language and sustainable land management practice, health and well-being of those who live along the path for everyday connections used by residents and workers to be physically and mentally healthy. And, and like I said, it, it, it means a lot for us and the other part of our nation that I have to include in, in this climate change and, in, and for our land, when the ferry came through, it cut off some of our, our nation. But the very most important part that it cut out was, was where, where our ancestors were buried along the middens, hey? right along the, where our hill goes. So we are working with that now and, and trying to make sure that it is, it is saved because that's where our ancestors were buried. And another thing about us being a host nation, you, 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 people don't know when, when I say, welcome to our land and I put my hands up like this, it's because we're connected to the island and connected to Staelis and beyond there, because Staelis is part of the Stolo nation. So when the Stolo nations, um, very important, but they they don't know about about our people being the host. So us in First Nation, a lot of First Nation people before we had settlers died on our nation. They didn't make it. They and they their health wasn't good, and they were going through, and a lot of people that we don't know today that our ancestors knew died on our First Nation lands. So we are, we are uh, on a land that is very important to our ancestors. And we cannot forget that lots of other First Nations coming through here and stopping to rest and to eat or to visit their relatives. That we have lots of other First Nations that are here on our land. So we have to take care of our little nation here. Take care of the land that other ancestors are buried here. So this is very important and this, this this is important to a lot of other nations. When you hear on the news, oh no, look at those Indians again, them stopping, stopping in the growth and progress because, oh, their ancestors are buried here. Well, I've heard some people say, well, you wouldn't go into a white nation where, where their ancestors are, you wouldn't see them diving through there and, and digging it all up to say, oh, we've got to build something here. Well, just think of us when you hear about us. Thank you. I should be looking at the time. Oh, I've got half an hour. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm just telling you these stories so that you know why it's important. Oh, this is so very important for me. And, and I have to thank our great Blue Heron Way committee members and, and Sandra who brought me here. But the one who got me there is a friend who is gone now and that is Arno. Arno was the one who got me to be here in Westminster to be a, a present, presenter in this place and it was and it was so very important to me. So I'll read this and you can read it on here. But I but 
I wanted you to have this information so that you know what the Great Blue Heron Way is. Supporting Friends of the Great Blue Heron Way, 2007 to 2021. BC Cycling Coalition, BEST. Safe Route Sawasan, VF. RL, BC, Barry, Trails, BC, The Great Trail, Experience the Fraser, Arbutus Greenaway Improvement Society, Fraser Health, City of Delta, MP, Carla Coltro, Hub Cycling and the local Hub Cycling Swanson Delta Committee, the City of Delta Community Livability Committee, Metro Vancouver, BC Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, Vancouver, Fraser, Port Authority. This is very important that I went to Westminster and did that because the audience was so very happy. And, and, and the way I told about the Great Blue Heron, they thought, oh, it's it's all happening now. <laughs> they, they didn't know that uh, we were still on our way to making it happen. But like I said, like I said there, it was very important for friends. Just making sure I get, get through all of this without forgetting anyone because everyone is important. Acknowledgement and reconciliation. Rec Knowledge. Oh, I'm getting mixed up. Acknowledgement, Acknowledgement and recognition. Yes. Okay, that is my main point of why I'm doing this. Climate change action, helping to encourage the use of active transportation that has expanded during the COVID-19 pandemic and may make sure it is inclusive to youth and families and all financial. Oh, that is the wrong one, isn't it? Oh, here I am. Sorry about that. I am mixed up. Oh. Ah, that's a great to hear my history. Swanson First Nation Neighborhood Plan. A clear welcoming path for travelers and commuters. The Great Blue Heron Way will connect and be signed route for all connected routes on Vancouver Island and the mainland. In 2016, a portion of the Great Blue Heron Way was opened. The Swanson First Nation Breakwater, Breakwater Multi-Youth Path Project. Funders, TFN, BC Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, Bike BC, TransLink and Aquilini. Aquilini is where Richard Cook came in, who I mentioned. In 2019, Elder Ruth was invited to present at the inaugural BC Active Transportation Summit. So that was what I was talking about for uh, Westminster and that they were so, they were so happy to, to hear my presentation. In 2020, Great Blue Heron Way, we finding signage supported by TFN Chief and Executive Council. 2020 and 2021, continuing outreach to stakeholders. In 2021, the Ministry of Transportation and Highways, MOTI, is assisting with MUP extensions at TFN. And I am so grateful. I am so grateful that is the boardwalk. And like I said, our chief and executives for the, what, three, three of them are so busy, as you can tell, with, with the mall and when our industrial lands and the ferry and the port. That, that, that is why I'm doing this. And I could not do this with the help of all of these friends who you will see noted in our presentation. But that is, isn't that beautiful? Eh? This is, and that's okay, Sandra. <laughs> okay. 
I am reading this because I I talk a lot and my friend Sandra, she writes out most of the things that that I am talking about. So she has written a lot of this and that is why I am reading this because I honor Sandra for doing this for me. She is, she is like my sister. She is like my sister. I cannot thank her enough and, and David and, and Leon and Roel and, and all of the others, but those are the, my main ones on my committee. And Carol, and like I said, Arno is gone, but he is the one that led me out into the province. So the Great Blue Heron Way, there's currently a focus on the mainland Salish Sea route. In 2021, six business cases have been prepared for root gaps. There are within MOTI jurisdiction listed north to south. Northwest Marine Drive, Richmond's Airport Connector, Moray Channel, Bridges, Sea Island to Lulu Island, and we are connected to Lulu Island. My grandfather used to always talk about Lulu Island. Delta Port Highway Transportation Corridor, Highway 17 at 52nd Street by Sawasan Mills Shopping Center, Sawasan BC Ferry Terminal, Causeway Highway 17, Highway 99 from 8th Avenue to Canada, USA Peace Arch border crossing alongside Semi Amo Nation. So it's very important because those are a lot of things that David and Leon are involved with and these maps. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It just make me cry, my committee members. All of this means so much to me. And Jessica, who did these papers for me, because like I said, I'm old. I like to look at the paperwork. I, I like the Zoom because it is so clear. But this is, this, this is so important to me. And, and, and for me, I want all semi ammo is a little nation too. And they're just now getting their water. Can you believe that? Semi Amo just now getting their water in 2021. So it is not only the nations are way up in the never, never lands where nobody sees them. Semi Amo right between White Rock and Surrey. I say a big hi and honor to you Semi Amo people. So this is why this is important. I want other little nations that get no honor or recognition or acknowledgement for what, how, what they have shared with their traditional territories. And traditional territories is big. Please remember that. Traditional territories, you look at, you get a hold of maps and, and it's probably gonna be my group that will be doing that work when we get funding from other people and other governments that think our work is important. It is important to us and it is important to a lot of other First Nations. Okay, Sandra. And next. I just want you to, I just, I'm telling you stories as I'm going through because I want you to know the reason why it is so important to me and other First, other First Nations that don't get recognized or acknowledged and they're plunked right in the middle of, of progress and nobody says thank you for the progress that is in their First Nation traditional territory. Okay, Delta, these are all important because David and Leon are, are doing hard work with these. Delta Port Highway Transportation, cross rail, access, cross rail access for pedestrians and cyclists was stopped in 2016. And this is what I was telling you about where the port is part of us and the railroad. They, they, we connected to 
Delta Ladner, hey, on our break water. I said we could be even bigger than Stanley Park if we, we could go all the way to Point Roberts and around to Ladner and into Vancouver and over the border to, to, to La Mia. And we used to own the land in Point Roberts, but this is how nice our nation was. They recognized the border. Okay, that is how great our ancestors of Sawasan First Nation were and still are today. They've got a big, big heart for sharing. Port container trains have priority. No alternative crossing has been provided. This action severs an indigenous trail between TFN lands on the Salish Sea and Canoe Pass at the mouth of the Fraser River. And, and this is important because my, the one who did my Great Blue Heron logo, he he's, he's did posts along there. And if you go on the Fraser River, because that's where we do, that's where we fish, but along there is, is we've got a, uh, what do you call it, Jessica, uh, uh, in where we do our fishing. Anyways, we could bicycle from here to there where, where we have our wharf, eh? Mm -hmm. We have a wharf in, in Ladner. Well, well, it's connected to Ladner. It's really our traditional territory, so it's really ours. But, but we've got a post there. And, and that, like I said, we're very important people on this land. And we made our treaty so the governments would not do what they would do and never give us a cent or recognize us for anything. This is why we did our treaty. So there's some nations that say, oh, we sold a No, we sold in. <laughs> We sold in and we're going to get taxes. We're going to pay taxes, but we're going to collect taxes. This federal review panel report for the Roberts Bank Terminal 2 project, March 2020, requires meaningful consultation with First Nations, cites the vision and purpose of the Great Blue Heron Way supports the need for a pedestrian and cycle overpass at the Roberts Bank Causeway. Okay, and this is very important because it connects us to Ladner and Delta. Okay, it's very important. And what I say about this is they, they um, put that barrier and said it's not safe for people to be crossing there. And when one of their workers got hurt there, well, that should not have been the end of the story that they should have made it safe for us to cross. They should have made it safe for people that are working there, staff who are working there. You, and this is what they do to First Nations, the governments, and it is wrong. So I want you all to remember it's wrong to just cut it off, just cut us off from our traditional territories and just cut us off when we want to be good neighbors. They need to think of us local communities. They need to think of us. Yeah. Oh, this is very important. Oh my goodness, you needed to give me two hours, I guess. <laughs> Okay, partnerships for solutions. And and these are, I, I did this, they made, I'll just read it because it's important to me. June 2020 bike trip with Hub Cycling Delta Trails BC TFN. Special permission granted to enter TFN lands during the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. Exploring the possibilities for bike routes currently uses a makeshift ditch crossing and lengthy rural road detour for walking and biking need shorter length use of BC Hydro substation Dyke Access Road, 
BC Rail, Port Service Road, Delta Port Way and Structure, ideally a new MUP bridge. 2021 follow-up, bike ride report sent to stakeholders, invitation to present a receipt to present received from stakeholders, port and MOTI, mapped ideas provided to stakeholders, jurisdiction, land map, drafted and provided by the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, business case for MOTI prepared and sent. That, that, that is how connected we are. That is, it's important that we are connected and it's important. So, oh, this is another great map. Great map. Thank you so much, Sandra, David and Leon for this work that you do and the goal. This is it, and I need to bring in what Leon talks about all the time, and that we couldn't put absolutely everything in this presentation, otherwise I'd need two hours, three hours. <laughs> Anyways, Leon says, yeah, what, what he is saying, we can have circles. You don't have to go along all these long routes that, that, that it, we're making it so is that if you want to bicycle or even just walk around in, in the circle that you are in to in, enjoy the nature. And when you, I say why I'm doing this is because there is so much development and now is the time that we can save the bit of nature that we can walk along or bicycle along to see the birds and the fish and the water. I tell you, water to us, I, I put that in my presentation because we're always trying to save our land, but our waters are really important too because we lived on the waters. Our ancestors lived on the waters and we went to, to community to community on the water. So it was our roadway, the waters. And so, and the other part about this, is that all along here, I can tell you in Delta where our ancestors walked and rode with horses along those trails, that was trails that we used before anyone came. And these trails that I, I'm working with my friends now, those are trails that we already were doing on the old days of our ancestors before anyone came. So what, what the Great Blue Heron is doing today is that, like I said, I want to see if we can go to First Nation to First Nation on these beautiful trails, BC trails and the Great Canadian Trail. Doing this, doing this because we want people to know that we want to be involved and we want to be participant. And we want to be friends with everybody in our traditional territory. So, and, and to be friends means that we can save, can save the little bit of land. And also this is teaching people about how many jurisdictions you have to go through and uh, educating people that you can't just go, go and ask the chief of this is all right. Those are the old Indian Act days. But it is better now. We have to uh, have to learn about the people in the First Nation, and this is what my friends have done. They have come to our Aboriginal Days that we celebrate here, and uh, some have come to our Treaty Days. If we have a Treaty Day celebration, not with COVID, hey, that has stopped everything. But we will do it again, and you would all be invited when we open up again. But I think I, I can't believe I have gone through, I've got 10 more minutes and I haven't given you any time to, to ask questions, but, but this was mainly about honoring my, my friends and the committee members that have come along with me through all of this. Yes. 
and Sandra and David and Leon and Carol and Raul and, uh, and Richard Cook and the chiefs that have been beside me through this. And I have to tell you, Carl Morgan, my nephew, uh, we sent it to them, but I didn't know whether they had three days that they could be on Zoom. But also to let you know that I want to be the member on the BC Trails and the Great Canada Trail. And, and so I will be there for all of you whenever you need me to be there to explain things. And I have to, I have to thank this presenter she had on yesterday. I have to, I am old, I have to look at the names that, um, the, let me see, Minister M Melanie Mark, who, who mentions the Alice. Thank you, thank you. So we'll be able to connect to my father's place, the Alice. And Amethan, Amethan Sibaraja, thank you to you too for doing that. That's the work that I do, trying to tell people about our people and how we face racism in today's day and age, 2021. So all of you friends, I thank you for being here and thank you for the education that you are doing. And thank you very much BC Trails for making us a part of you. Okay, and I know you'll be friends that will be helping us to get rid of the systemic racism in Canada. Because here on our nations, we, we go through the what's left of the systemic racism. And that's, oh, what do I call it? See, I've talked too much. I can't remember. I'm too old. What is it? Intergenerational trauma. Yeah. Yeah, that there's a name for it. I can't think of it. But anyways, we, we have a lot to do. Uh, healing in our First Nations because they have taught us to be powerful and to um, think that there's some rich people in our nation and some poor people in our nation and some are good and some are bad. No, we're all good and we're all rich, but we're having to deal with that relative. What is it? can't think of it but we are having to deal with the Indian Act and with our treaty we're having to push out all of those ugly things that the Indian Act did to us and with us so our our people have learned through that too so now we're having to unlearn that and to heal our people so thank you for being here and thank you for inviting me. It means a lot to me, my family and to this nation. And, and thank you to all of our chief and executives and legislatures, which my other granddaughter, Marianne, who helps me is a legislator. So I'm always talking in her ear. No, don't do that, do this. <laughs> so I'm a real activist. So. If you ever need me, and if I got the time, I'll help you out with whatever you need. Sorry, Thank you. But I Thank you. Thank welcome. you so much, Elder Ruth. Thank you so much. Thank you. It has been an honor to be here with all of you. I'm sorry I didn't give you enough time for questions, <laughs> but I'm I'm hoping that some of the things that that you're that you want to know about us, I hope I answered some of them in my presentation. Yeah, well, you know, um, Elder Ruth, I'm not sure if our next presenter is here, but um, you are certainly getting a lot of uh, comments in the chat of thanks and gratitude. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just been such an honor. Um, Amethyn, just that's what he just wrote. It's 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 uh, on the space and community and story with you, Elder Ruth. Oh, so thank I, you. I, I would uh, hope that with uh, the times changing, that perhaps the two of you will, will meet in person. Oh, I'd love that. I would just love that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to meet all of you. 
I want to meet all of you when this is all past and we're all alive from the COVID. <laughs> well, we're going to get on that great blue heron trail one day. Yeah. Have a big party. Oh, that'd be great. And what I see, not, not all is bad. We've got the mall and the industrial lands and what they did for us is, and if you ask our committee, they put these wide um, board, not boardwalks, it's sidewalks, eh? They've made it nice and wide. And since we can't go nowhere, I see all of the people that have leased their, our houses. They're walking on there with their dogs and, and it's, it's nice to go. They've, they've done a good job of um, making it nice, but I think it's because of my great blue hair and way they did that. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if you if you remember, but I've actually met you as well. Oh, no. I, <laughs> where did I meet you? Oh, at the uh, Active Transportation Summit. Oh, yes. In, yes. Uh, yeah, in... Uh, well, wherever it was. I call it. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank oh, you very much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. Okay. Okay. It looks like uh, we have our next presenter. Well, and thanks very much for having me. And, and, yeah. And well, the, thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm sure Leon's got lots to say, but you guys will probably get chatting sometime yes. soon about all this. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. <Bye> for now. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I've got controls. So. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Do I ever have control? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's see here. There we go. Hi there. Hi. I would like to welcome now to. Uh, our symposium, uh, Elizabeth May, who uh, I don't think probably anybody needs a real introduction, but um, I actually, uh, she probably doesn't remember this either, but I've actually heard at the Canada Velo Bikes Conference in Ottawa um, at the last one before the pandemic. And she just gave a terrific talk and I just uh, don't wanna talk anymore because the okay. floor is hers. Okay, thank you. And uh, it was lovely to see Elder Ruth for a bit there. I, I got in and it was, well, land of Zoom. But let me just start by acknowledging the territory I'm on. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so blessed to live here in the territory of Wasana Nations. I raise my hands to all of you. Haishka, Haishka Sam. I know you're from all over from looking through the names that I see here on the participant list. I know I see friends from the Kootenays and people from all over, uh, all over BC anyway, and it's just fantastic. So the language in which I just said hello and my, it's not, I, I should need to learn lots more of this language, but it's Senchothan. So I'm in the territories of Senchothan speaking peoples and Haishka, Haishka Sam is both a welcome and a thank you and an acknowledgement and a deep sense of gratitude to live in this place. So, um, and actually for those of you, never really mulling it over, but um, the name of, of, you've probably all traveled through to this territory coming in to go to Victoria or whatever. Um, and it's called the Saanich Peninsula, but of course that's a mispronunciation and Anglic Anglicization of the word was Saanich which I'm still probably not pronouncing. I'm gonna keep trying, um, but there's uh, this territory of the Coast Salish people that extends from both sides of the arbitrary international boundary, which also has relatives of Sartlet friends of mine on both sides of that border. In any case, it's an honor to have been asked to speak about um, the most recent uh, federal announcement that advances something that I think we've all, you know, I, I know we've all wanted to see it for a very, very long time, which is the advent of a national active transportation policy. Um, and when I did meet you in Ottawa, we had, you know, we had a lot of MPs who are from what we call um, our, our bicycling caucus, uh, wanting to see more active transportation built in and I think it's very cool that this programming came through Infrastructure Canada, 
um, not from there is a there is a, a, a junior department of sport, but it didn't come through that it came through infrastructure, which is a bigger acknowledgement that we have a lot more to do. So when we think about what we have to do, it's really looking at having a national strategy, um, preferably coast to coast to coast that encourages people to walk to hike to bike and be able to do it safely in security, knowing that there's a safe lane, knowing that the, that the trails connect, knowing that there's good intermodal uh, interconnectivity. Uh, and, and I think that this particular announcement, I hope, is just the beginning because we're looking at possibilities for um, this initial tranche of funding is going to, I think, be gone relatively quickly. And we're going to be looking at um, needing to uh, see that money well spent. We, I'm sure we're going to see a lot of people applying for it. There'll be, uh, I'm sure, a few showcase uh, commitments that will be in the, the, the Monday's budget. Uh, and we're going to be looking at national active transportation strategy and a national active transportation infrastructure. And I just say that I think that we, we, we know it's not going to be um, enough money to do all of what we need to do. We, we've, we've seen the potential of it with the money that was spent, I guess, since 2015, it's been about $130 million in uh, under 130 actual individual uh, programs and specific ventures, whether from um, the Flora footbridge in Ottawa, which I like walking across when I'm in Ottawa for work. I have, fortunately, because, no, I wouldn't say fortunately, but due to COVID, unfortunately, I haven't been crossing the Flora footbridge. Uh, fortunately, I am able to work from home here, and that helps a lot. Uh, and of course, the, the big Grouse Mountain Regional Park trails in Vancouver, we have a really wonderful program uh, and project here uh, in my community that we'd really love to see fully funded and fully interconnected in, in the Salish Sea Trail. And we have, and there's a Salish Sea bike route and we need quite a lot of engineering done before we can even start um, saying exactly how we're going to do it because the Salish Sea Trail uh, through Salt Spring Island, uh, that's one of the places it, which you know people love to come and bicycle, but it's it's really not safe. So it's it's windy and narrow, and and it needs first some engineering work, and it needs to be fully funded, and it needs to then connect, so it can connect with the Lockside and the Galloping Goose and the Cowichan Valley Regional Trail. Um, so it's a very important new piece of of infrastructure, and again, I acknowledge with gratitude that it is seen now as infrastructure and not you know, kind of fringy. I think a lot of the post COVID response is going to encourage more of this. We know that um, there's going to be, I hope a period of our lives that's post COVID. Right now I'm feeling um, a bit overwhelmed by recent diagnoses of people in my family and, and losing a friend yesterday. Um, so in any case, at some time we'll be able to talk about post COVID. Uh, there'll be a lot more demand from Canadians for ways to be outdoors, for ways to be continuing at distance. I mean, the kind of renaissance of inner cities to say, we need more outdoor space. We need more patio space. We need more livable places and cities. That's That translates to, we can, we're gonna have to shift our land use planning at long last away from having the personal automobile uh, be the I mean, sort of a pun, but unintentional. Be the driver of how urban design plays out, how we, how where we live, and and how we move around. So active transportation it, it ticks all the boxes. It helps reduce greenhouse gases. It keeps us healthier. It responds to a strong human need to have spaces where we can be, and where our and where by being active in our transportation. We are healthier. We're practicing preventative medicine by being outdoors, by connecting with nature, and by using our bodies to move us from place to place. So it's it's um, there's 
there's nothing bad to say about it except that it's great. And all of your work is so helpful. I, I know you gave me more time than I need to speak about this because we're all, as a friend of mine used to say, we're all in violent agreement. But if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to try to answer any of them. We're looking at an exciting, I, and I do think that, you know, as an opposition member of parliament, I'm optimistic that the government's going to come through on this. I don't, but in many instances, uh, most of the things on which I work day to day uh, are places where I'm not optimistic. You know, when we talk about, are we really going to get to truth and reconciliation? Are we really going to talk about the report of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls? Are we really going to be serious about climate action? Those are places where you don't find me saying, well, the government's doing such a good job. But I do feel as though this is a place where real change can and will happen. And as we use the first tranche of funds that, have, that are coming out, um, we should be looking at putting our best foot forward, literally and figuratively, and making sure that we uh, use money well, well and wisely and demonstrate to the Minister of Infrastructure, whoever he or she may be or they over time. Uh, right now it's Catherine McKenna and Catherine McKenna is 100% sold on this. For the next Minister of Infrastructure to be sold on it, we have to make sure that the programs are well run, that they are popular, they're well designed and they come in on budget. We do all those things as a community and we can keep building out the network building out a complete interconnected network for walking and bicycling and jogging and all those things, cross country skiing, active transportation is going to make a very, um, a, a very big difference in the day-to-day -day life of Canadians, as long as we keep advocating for it and implementing it effectively. So I'm happy to stop there in case, and thank you for promoting me to a minister and don't be embarrassed. I'd be very happy to have been prime minister, but it is what it is. I'm very happy to be the member of parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands. Oh yeah, integrating, yes, public transportation. Absolutely, thank you, Tara. That's what I, I, I skipped over. Intermodal transit is really, you know, so you need to know that for instance, you know, when, you, when we talk about tourism for Canadians, and I'm very concerned the tourism sector has had such a devastating wallop through COVID. It's one of the aspects of our economy that's hardest hit. But we need to make sure that we offer low, low carbon tourism. So we need to see the investments in via rail. I don't know if you know this, but from Toronto if, or, or from Vancouver, you can load a canoe on via rail and you can take it off at a very small stop. I don't even think it's got a platform uh, and go canoeing uh, in, near Armstrong, Ontario, and then wait couple of weeks till you camp and then you get back on the train. You can put a canoe, you can put a bicycle on via rail, but do we, do we have enough inter, intermodal connectivity to, for instance, this is a real problem. If you, if you take the train to Edmonton, there is absolutely no way to leave the Edmonton train station other than calling a cab. Well, you can take your bike off the train if you remember to bring your bicycle. So we need to make sure that there's that connectivity with our, our urban transit, our city buses, a lot of cities, as I know a lot of you know, you can put your, your bicycle on a, a rack on the front of the bus and then you're set. Uh, your canoe, not so much. So the inter, intermodal connectivity is key to the design of the whole system, uh, particularly for public transportation. I saw another question that was from Tara House, who I, who I actually know and say hi to Tara. Um, well, she's, she's, on, she's the next presenter. By oh, the way. good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's a great question from Nicholas Scott about reconciliation. One of the aspects, let, let's just returning to the to the recommendations of the inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. As you know, the scandalous reality is that if you're low income in this country, particularly if you're living in a more remote area, you don't have transportation. It's nothing being made available for you. We used to have bus service. Um, buses have largely been withdrawn from most of Canada. Like we focus on our own areas, but it's a national crisis in ground transportation. We nearly lost Wilson's bus lines uh, in on Vancouver Island that runs some of the service to some of uh, indigenous communities. So in terms of reconciliation, uh, minimal step is to 
implement all the recommendations from the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry, close the man camps and make sure that Indigenous women have a safe, affordable, well, everyone, everyone, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, but in the context of reconciliation, we absolutely have to make sure that there is safe, affordable, reliable transportation to protect people uh, from being subject to the vulnerabilities of hitchhiking. Um, the, uh, the, uh, so um, interconnected, one of the things that where I may differ from some of you, so I'll, I'll put it out there just to say, I don't want us to pull up our rails to put in trails because we need those rails for the purposes of active interconnected ground transportation. Uh, and you know, the ENN railway for us here on Vancouver Island, we want it to work as a, as a daily service. It would remove the coal would crawl if the timing was right in making sure we had our trains. Someone's asking about um, uh, the, uh, wait, I missed that, ch the chat, it rolled by me and I'm gonna try to find who asked the question about uh, what we have, what we have in the United States in terms of an interconnected um, National Scenic Trails Act. Well, yes, the United States has it. Guess what else the United States has? It has legislation that mandates that Amtrak provide affordable passenger service. Here in Canada, Via Rail has no legislative mandate at all. Depending on who ended up on the board of Via Rail, they could cut all our trains except for the Windsor-Quebec corridor, which is a, a, a fear I have that some would actually like to do that. Uh, we need to bring back trains on a daily basis and have them connected to to, to basically, if they're like a spine, then you've got the ribs that go out from bus service and all of them should feed into convenient connectivity to networks of bicycle paths, walking trails, hiking trails, all of those connectivities. And again, when we're going through, traveling through indigenous territories, we should be able, oh, that was from Clara Hughes. Thank you so much. It, we should be able to say, Indigenous communities, if we're if we're walking on your territory, I'd certainly enjoy it. Be, feel free to set up a booth at edge of territory to collect the walking and cycling and visiting fee so that it begins to provide an economic benefit in communities that choose on a nation to nation sovereign basis to do that. That should be fully supported as part of a trails network across Canada. Yeah, okay, well, there we have it. Um, I think we got um, all the questions. And just so you know, we are working very hard on the Trans-Canada Trail to get it back to being non-motorized here in British Columbia. A lot of it is um, not very equitable at this point. And uh, so our next presenter actually um, was contracted uh, by us through a very generous foundation or very generous donation through the Vancouver Foundation. And um, we called it the Greenway, Greenways for All project. And we've since inserted trails. So Greenway Trails for All project. And um, at one of my uh, trips back to Ottawa uh, on behalf of um, Trail Society of BC, I met a gal who um, helped give really good insights about inequity. And uh, so, uh, it's really important to to be connected and i'm really glad everybody's here right now and i'm going to refer to um tara uh, and to damon who um, both worked on this project and um, i'm going to be quiet and they're going to present their research results fantastic cl and there's damon and and again big thank you to elizabeth for for coming out here it's uh quite a thing to be following uh, following right after Elizabeth. That's wonderful. I really do appreciate you taking the time today, though. And, and big thanks to Trails BC for um, allowing us to be here to present and having um, the, like I said, the, the ability to ask some of these questions that as we get into will be pretty interesting, I, I think, anyway. And, you know, again, Vancouver Foundation, shout out to them for, for providing the funding. So yes, my name is Tara House, and I was the, the lead researcher on this project. Uh, Damon Libby is my colleague and uh, his video is on now, lovely. 
and he uh, very he was integral. He was he was so helpful. He was a, officially a research assistant, whatever titles we want to give each other here. But he uh, he supported the the general research in this, but he also really led the indigenous aspect to it. And Damon will be speaking specifically about indigeneity and active transportation here in a few minutes. And um, and and from here, I just will. I guess we're just going to get going. I think we are good to go. I will note it's difficult to uh, watch the chat on the way, so I, I do apologize if something comes up and, and I miss it. I do apologize for that. Hopefully, we'll have some time at the end of this. The intention is that we'll be a couple speaking heads for maybe 25 minutes, half an hour, and then hopefully we'll have about half an hour of discussion time afterwards. Just a, a really quick broad overview here. Uh, just want to let you know we'll be going over the research and why we did it, uh, some main findings, um, what we can do and what you can do, and then getting into that discussion Q&A. Uh, I am also just going to pause here and have Damon do a broad land acknowledgement for Trails BC, but I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that I am calling in from Rossland, and that is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Sahilks, Sinaiks, Tanaha, the Sukhumak peoples. And we are in just this amazing kind of recreation, outdoor recreation mecca out here. And so I do feel very uh, grateful that we have that opportunity to participate in some of these recreational activities on the land. And Damon, I'll turn it over to you for a minute. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm calling uh, from the unceded territory of the Silk people, um, otherwise known as Kelowna, BC. Um, and I'd uh, just like to acknowledge that all of the province of British Columbia is on the unceded territory. There are a few land claims here and there um, and some treaties, but for the most part, it's, it's over 90% is, is unceded territories. And that, that's huge in terms of uh, just the, the ownership and the attachment and the really overall relationship to the land and what that means. Thanks, Damon. So our research, what did we do? What was Greenway Trails uh, for all, all about? Uh, the, the question that we asked was, what are the barriers that limit equitable access to active transportation in rural BC? And so what we were looking at were a number of uh, equity seeking groups. And we also considered indigeneity as a, a separate uh, kind of pathway for thinking Indigenous peoples have specific land relationships and of course government crown relationships that need to be considered. So the groups um, in addition to Indigenous peoples that we looked at were the queer, the queer community, LGBTQS+, we considered gender, people of color, diverse abilities, seniors, and of course all of that within the context of rural communities. Uh, methodology, just some, um, some fun nerd terms here for you. We looked at our uh, using intersection, uh, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, all right. Uh, we looked at using intersectionality uh, through a literature review and also some guided conversations with people. Intersectionality is just a form of, of um, inquiry that allows us to consider the various identity factors that may be limiting somebody's access to active transportation in this case. So how does a queer person of color, what, what, what do their experiences have um, in, an, in accessing active transportation? When we started some conversations, um, it became evident very, very early on that there was some potential trauma triggers that were arising. Our research was not set up to support or, um, or resource to support any type of trauma. And so we had to kind of scale back on some of those questions, but we did get a kind of basic understanding and some generalized understandings of what are happening. But it really does speak to the need to further support these types of lines of inquiry to understand what is preventing that access. And I do wanna, I'm not too sure exactly um, the, the groups of people that we have today on the call, but I just wanna take a note about the term equity that I'm using. I understand equity or equitability, equitable uh, may not be totally familiar to everyone. A lot of people may be familiar with equality. And I just wanna note that uh, intersectionality, the big piece with that is that it allows the recognition that we are not all equal and that we have different needs and different experiences that must be considered. And so we have to account for and ask these types of nuanced questions. So why it matters. Um, transportation inequity, it, it, it is a real thing. It actually, transportation, it is involved in all of our daily lives, whether we're going for groceries, going to work, running errands, going for recreation. The, the access to transportation in general can mitigate or exacerbate um, inequity that exists. 
uh, Elizabeth May just talked about land use planning and how our current land use planning actually favors the car and the car culture. And so what that means is when we, when we look at different groups and, and choices for people that have um, that can choose transportation with the car planning that exists, um, not everybody can actually afford to make a choice. Not everybody can afford a car. And so our transporta transportation planning and land use planning means that not everybody has equal access to transportation. We know that in, in rural versus um, urban areas, travel routes and travel patterns are different. We know that there's a general gender, gender bias that exists with travel patterns as well. And a lot of active transportation follows that with the assumption that somebody is going from point A, their home, to point B, work, and then back, which ignores um, various issues related to things like employment issues or um, accessing other errands and having to do multiple stops on a trip. And we also know that transportation, like I said, it can mitigate or exacerbate inequity because transportation and employment are intimately connected. If people don't have access to transportation, they can't get to work. What is really neat though, is that equity is becoming part of the transportation planning conversation in general. And social justice concepts are starting to emerge within all of these plans. And so people are starting to actually allocate resources um, into understanding where resources need to go. And so one term that's come up a couple of times was the, the difference between horizontal or vertical distribution of resources. And this speaks to equity versus equality as well. So in a horizontal distribution method, what happens in a city is that everybody has equal access to the exact same thing. Um, and so in active transportation, what we can look at is everybody is given a bike. The province of BC has decided everybody in the province gets a bike. So we all have access to a bicycle and that is equal access and it's horizontal. In contrast, vertical distribution considers things like some people are adults and some people are kids. Some people are tall, some people are short. Some people might be riding on a road, some people might be riding on a trail, and some people might need actual mobility aids to assist them in accessing that bike. And so if we take a vertical distribution um, account of resources, it actually goes to the people who need it most and allows those people to have true choice and true freedom of choice. Um, and then the last piece about this, like I alluded to a bit earlier, is that there's just a, a complete and utter lack of research in this field. It was very interesting, again, very early on, people have not been looking at inequity and active transportation. Um, and so we really consider this foundational but of course, that also means um, in foundational research, there's usually more questions that come out versus answers. But it does really speak to the need to continue these types of lines of research. There was absolutely no literature or resources related to indigeneity in active transportation. Um, regarding various equity groups in active transportation, there is a couple pieces, but not a lot. And all of that within a rural setting, there just, it doesn't exist. And what's really particularly notable for, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, trauma-related issues for Indigenous populations. Um, and again, Damon will get into that. But there's also historical violences that we have to consider that have occurred to uh, people of colour and our queer community in Canada. So again, ultimately, why does this matter? Why should you care about this? Um, you know, it matters because we have to be giving people the same opportunities for choosing transportation op options. And there's even less of those options when we consider whether or not somebody gets to choose active transportation. For rural considerations, we know that in BC, 40% of the population lives outside of the greater Vancouver or Victoria region. So when projects, rules, regulations, or any kind of programs are designed, they're typically urban centric and take in those local travel patterns and it ignores over 2 million people in our province. Rural communities we know have different travel needs and different travel patterns, such as they'll be going longer distances to travel for work or to conduct their errands, um, but they also have different resources that are available to them or lack thereof. If you consider a, a municipality with a stronger tax, ba tax base, they just simply have more available. Uh, and the complicating piece in rural areas is there's often overlapping jurisdictions that uh, need to be considered for any project. When we look at gender and understanding gender divide, we know that more than half of the general population, whether we're looking at Canada or, or BC, are women, um, but cycling rates amongst women are consistently less than half of men's. 
in Canada, it's approximately 30%. We know that uh, transportation patterns of women are significantly dinner, different due to employment and things like the uh, gendered labor divide. Uh, we know that personal security factors are also exacerbated uh, when we consider about harassment or abuse and people will take different routes home or go do their errands to avoid harassment or areas in which they feel they will experience harassment or abuse. When we consider income we, in BC, there's 1.8 million people that are netting less than $29,000 a year. And yet we also know that the highest user groups of active transportation are those in low income because they are the people without the option to purchase a car. And yet typically we ignore this population, they're invisible, and we just completely ignore the fact that they are the ones that are using it and have the fewest accesses to the resources. In addition, of these 1.8 million, almost 60% of these people are women. So again, we're intersecting all these identity factors and how does that consider uh, options to active transportation. For our seniors, we know that 18% of, of BC are seniors. And we know that half of that population are women, which also introduces personal security and question, uh, personal security questions, income questions, and mobility questions as well. When we look at disability, 6.2 million people in Canada report at least one disability, and often there's multiple disabilities that are reported. And yet, we, I could not find, uh, I, I, there was no information about disability and physical activity. There was one report that I found, it was from a 2012 report to the Standing Senate Committee on Human Rights. That was the only Canadian report I found on disability and physical activity. And that report noted that there is um, as low as a 3% participation rate. We know that disability and socioeconomic are, are very correlated with 1.6 million Canadians with a disability unable to afford basic living expenses that they require, such as life-saving prescriptions or various forms of uh, mobility or medical aid, aids. I'm just gonna take a moment to talk about an e-bike for a second, uh, simply because often when we look at mobility issues uh, and disability, the e-bike comes up at, um, as, a, as a bit of a panacea for, for sharing or, or you know, um, reducing, mitigating those active transportation access. And yet the e-bike is really expensive. And so if you are trying to promote an e-bike as, as a form of access to somebody with a disability who can't afford the prescription, uh, it just really seems to be missing the point and it can clearly be a huge barrier to somebody. Lastly, just a note about um, some systemic discrimination and how that plays into active transportation. Within the queer community in Canada, there is just very little research or recognition of those specific concerns. And this includes the, the recently released BC strategy, active transportation strategy that they have. We know that uh, the LGBTQS plus community in Canada faces increased harassment. They have lower rates of employment, um, and that includes opportunities for employment, advancement within the workforce, and also various uh, discrepancies in pay. We've got the stat there that 49% of trans Canadians earn less than $15,000 a year. In addition, in some of the corollary sectors uh, with active transportation, such as the health sector or the justice sector, we know there's historical discrimination that occurs. So for example, it was only in 2020 that the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police apologized for the historical uh, discrimination that uh, our queer community in Canada has faced. These experiences, systemic discrimination, are also experienced by people of color. Just going to take a moment to hear, I, I do have um, a quote from somebody that could be a potential trigger to, uh, to people on this call, so just uh, highlight that. The bulk of active transportation advocates and planners, decision makers, are white, male, and generally pretty wealthy, at least in the higher socioeconomic stratum. This can mean that they can include, or sorry, exclude people, and it could be intentional or it could be by accident, but the exclusion means that people of color uh, might be the recipient of ill-informed policies or programs that perpetuate inequality, inequity, and discrimination. One interviewee noted, and this is the trigger alert warning, one interviewee noted that bad things happen in the woods. And this was a reference to lynchings by the KKK in Canada that happened in forests. And it helps us understand and speaks to how uh, an historical atrocity 
might be preventing modern day access to something that is typically perceived as free in the outdoor recreation sector. So with that, I'm going to pause here and let Damon take over and have a um, and speak a bit about active transportation and indigenity. Perfect. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Tara. Um, so I just want to start off by um, just thanking everyone for, for being here. Um, my name is Damon Libby. Um, I'm a recent graduate uh, from here at, uh, in Kelowna, UBC Okanagan. Um, and uh, my background is I, ident I identify as Indigenous. Um, my status was lost. I don't know which nation I belong to. Um, this is all, you know, the reality of the provision under the Indian Act and the assimilation cycle um, that the colonial nation state of Canada has, has undertaken on Indigenous peoples um, since the beginning of colonization. And so um, I just kind of want to echo a remark that Elder Ruth Adams that said, uh, you know, not too long ago, she said, you know, she's proud to be First Nations and I'm proud to be First Nations as well. Us Indigenous youth, we wouldn't be able to succeed without the paths that uh, elders such as Elder Ruth Adams and our ancestors forged for us. So I'm very thankful for people like uh, Elder Ruth Adams and um, and you know the, the many other situations uh, such as hers that that have allowed for people like me to take up the space. So so you know just a huge thank you to you. Um, so in regards to Indigenous Peoples Act of Transportation. Um, there's a litany of issues that are exclusive to Indigenous peoples, and this is a huge reason why in our final report for this Greenways for All research, Indigenous issues are in a separate section. There are issues that are linked to colonization, intergenerational trauma as a re result of residential schools, which are both exclusive to Indigenous peoples. The trauma that occurs due to the ongoing acts of dispossession as well as the inherent trauma linked to the legacy of residential schools continues to be experienced by Indigenous people and is exclusively felt by Indigenous people. Colonization is a continued structure. The dispossession of Indigenous lands is a continued process. The assimilation cycle is also a continued process. This is not going away. Although there is more attention to these issues, they continue to occur. And the outdoor recreation and tourism sector sectors are both culprits in this continued colonization. Dispossession is the foundation for outdoor recreation throughout North America. Exploration is a privilege. Being able to explore different regions and lands in Canada is a privilege. Exploration and outdoor recreation in itself is enacting colonization. This is due to the notion of the act itself and what it represents. Settler descendant peoples are outsiders, although some commonly travel for the sake of recreation without understanding what that means. You're traveling within unceded lands in British Columbia and traversing Indigenous peoples' lands that have and continue to be Indigenous lands since time immemorial. Exploration within the lens of recreation is premised on the dispossession of Indigenous lands from Indigenous peoples. The only way to combat this is by understanding whose lands you are traversing, the cultural value to said lands. And uh, without knowing this full story, you're enacting colonization. This is a huge point that was brought up through Elder Ruth Adams' presentation through the Great Blue Heron Way. They're trying to share this story and using the Great Blue Heron Way in order to share their story as the Swasson First Nations. And it's, it's a huge effort to undertake. And I'm just so glad that um, as an organization, um, you know, Trails BC, we are helping kind of tell this story and, and working with the Swasson First Nations to be able to share this story. Uh, so continuing on, you are using your privilege as a settler descendant person to enact your own individualistic agenda, which is the basis of recreation. Recreation in Canada was made by and for settler descendant peoples within Indigenous lands. This is done through the process of repurposing lands for the purpose of recreation, which is again, a settler descendant activity. In terms of trails and colonization, indigenous peoples have distinct relationship with trails as a result of colonization. This is due to the implication of trails in relation to advancing colonization, such as you know, fur, 
fur trade routes, gold rush trails, and settler trails. The land was dramatically altered as a result of trails, um, and it was a huge component of colonization. And trails continue to be indicative of colonization. And a, a large part of this is, is due to the relationship that recreation and tourism has had in dispossessing Indigenous peoples. Uh, in terms of railways and rail trails, the imposition, the imposition of railways was another mode of dispossessing Indigenous peoples by relocating them to reserves. It was also one of the modes of transporting Indigenous peoples from reserves to residential schools. There's inherent trauma linked to both events. And as Tara brought up, we didn't have the modes in place to kind of do this trauma and um, trauma-induced, uh, you know, kind of looking at it from that perspective, uh, trauma-informed research, that's the word I was looking for. And, and so this was something that was brought to attention through this research, but we couldn't dive into it because again, we just didn't have those modes in place. This is obviously gonna differ from person to person and uh, nation to nation base in terms of, you know, uh, the, the trauma that's linked to, you know, being transported from a reserve to a residential school, it's gonna be based on proximity to that railway, but some will be affected by railways and have negative feelings attached to railways and those memories. This will not change if a railway is then transformed, or yeah, is then transformed into a rail trail. This is something that needs to be further research, although it is a difficult topic to elaborate on for some. Due to the imposition of colonization, residential schools, and what the railway means to certain indigenous nations and peoples, this must be taken into consideration. Within the context of reserves and within indigenous lands and communities, there can be a litany of issues related to differing jurisdictions. And what I mean by saying this is that there can be food insecurity, housing shortages, health issues, and location to nearest health services and other issues that affect an individual's well-being throughout reserves and indigenous lands. These issues would be prioritized over the establishment of trails and active transportation routes. Therefore, it's crucial to begin by just speaking to members of a community prior to undergoing any talks relating to trail or active transportation projects. I also think that this is what makes it difficult to gain attention to the importance of trails and active transportation projects, partnerships with indigenous nations. Um, I, I had an interview with uh, Patrick Lucas, which we did, we had a webinar uh, with Patrick Lucas and Tom Eustache. And um, you know, the work that Patrick Lucas does, if you're familiar with him, um, it's very much focused on getting the community involved to get the ball rolling because if a community is interested in the project, then it has a greater chance of going through. Uh, from talks and interviews that I've had with Patrick, that's what he focuses on. If the community is invested in a trail project, then they can pressure leadership to take it on for the betterment of the community. And this is an important perspective that we need to take into consideration. There's also a need to work with indigenous peoples to integrate indigenous perspectives within trail and active transportation projects. This is a huge part of the Great Blue Heron Way project, um, as well as the Chief Isidore Trail near Cranbrook, uh, the Nuxalk Carrier Grease Trail in central British Columbia, and the Cheechmahan Trail in Port Townsend, Washington, are perfect examples of this, integrating Indigenous perspectives and, and working with Indigenous communities to, to get their stories um, in plaques and, and different uh, areas to be showcased for you know, whether it be tourists or locals to understand those stories and those perspectives. In these trails, tourists and locals alike can learn from indigenous histories and or complex settler and indigenous relations during different points of history. It is important to have these perspectives within the context of trails and active transportation projects because individuals have the option to learn more about these stories and histories and they have the opportunity to learn more about the nations that have called those lands home since time immemorial. If you travel to different trails and active transportation routes throughout British Columbia, there are numerous examples of trails that outline different pioneer histories and pioneer stories. And there are interpretive tours offering those experiences, but there are a few examples of indigenous histories that are available with the context of trails in British Columbia in indigenous led interpretive tours. 
Um, there's a great one just down the road for me in a Soyuz at the Incomeet Cultural Center. I highly recommend it if you're in the area or if you're traveling there. Don't be traveling now though because of COVID, but uh, you know, when all of this stuff is over, um, go check out the Incomeet Cultural Center. They have a great indigenous flood interpretive tour, but there's, there's very few examples of, of uh, places like that, that that offer those perspectives. And it, these need to be more widely available to establish different narratives, indigenous led narratives. And this is an important component of reconciliation within the context of trails and active transportation. So yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have. Uh, that was quite a mouthful. So I, I'm gonna hand it over to Tara. Thanks, David. See the, the chat going. Like I said, I, I can't fully follow the chat while doing this. So, so please um, keep, the, keep the questions and hopefully CL can help uh, manage those after. So we did all this research. Uh, what does it mean? You know, what, what did we find out? Because we did find out some things. Kind of came up with five basic barriers and challenges that existed to uh, the equitable access of active transportation, again, with a focus on rural BC. The first one for anyone who, sorry, first one who's anyone who's uh, involved in advocacy is probably familiar with safety. But when we look at it with an intersectional perspective, safety and personal security actually come out a bit more hand in hand. Mostly we think about safety as one in regards to infrastructure, such as having that physical barrier to protect cyclists or pedestrians. But with personal security issues, it takes it one step further. We have to understand how personal security is impacted by things like end of use facilities infrastructures, such as a, a gender binary or gender friendly bathroom or our bike racks placed in areas that don't have any lighting. And how do the placements of routes impact personal security from harassment or abuse or prevent that from happening? Are there streetlights along the route? Are those bathrooms set up? And those types of questions came up very clearly. The second point there, a lack of Indigenous consideration. I mean, very quickly and very summarily, there, were, there has not been the consideration for indigeneity and active transportation. It just doesn't exist. And Damon did a lovely job of highlighting many of those things. So we have to be asking, and we have to continually and routinely ask, how does the dispossession of land for railways and then the transition of those rail lines to trails affect Indigenous peoples? And what presumptions are you bringing forward, particularly in relation to an economic development pitch if a community is facing safe water or housing shortages issues? When we talk about um, inclusion and diversity, this overall lack of representation exists. It exists in government, organizations, it exists in the outdoor recreation sector as a whole. It's largely a white male and wealthy run sector. And we have to be doing things to address this. And we have to be asking uh, questions to ensure that diversity, representation and inclusion are brought forward and actually embedded within decision making. This creates a, a pattern that perpetuates discrimination and reduces feelings for inclusion of other people. When we look at rural capacity, Rural communities have significant barriers related to limitations and resources. There are multiple types of ruralities, and so it's really difficult to very strictly define rural. Um, and you can also uh, layer on remote communities. Some may or may not be uh, rural. And when we consider about these different ruralities, uh, I do tease Damon a little bit because Kelowna is considered uh, a rural by, by many standards. And yet, what does uh, the city of Kelowna have uh, when you consider it in relation to, say, a First Nations community that typically has less than a thousand people, a thousand person population. And so it's by no means to take away from Kelowna as defining themselves as rural. But we have to recognize the different capacity levels that exist. And I talked to, about that a little bit uh, earlier, things like travel patterns, uh, but multiple jurisdictions really come up. And so if we're creating a trail, the Trans-Canada Trail, Great Trail is a great example of it. Um, you might be dealing with a municipal, a local municipality uh, a regional district, a First Nations band, you might be dealing with the Ministry of Highways, you might be dealing with the Agricultural Land Reserve in BC if it goes across farmland, and there could even be some federal jurisdictions that cross in there. And all that uh, happens in, in a rural community that typically just doesn't have the resources or, or staff on hand to navigate all these types of things. Many small rural communities don't have a city planner. So how does that affect implementation? And lastly, I'm a researcher, I can't leave this out. There's just this overall lack of data. We don't have any data. We don't, we know some of the questions that we have to ask, but we don't have the answers. And without data, we can never figure out what the solutions can be. 
I do have a video here um, and it is a Patagonia produced film by, uh, sorry, by Patagonia. And it features Brooklyn Bell, who is a Washington based mountain biker, woman, person of color and graphic designer. She was really feeling what's called the white gaze um, within the mountain biking community, whether she was going to events or just on the trail and decided to create um, a, a character, a comic book character called Ruby to help prevent, or sorry, help break down that um, uh, representation barrier for young girls so that young girls who are black can actually see themselves as mountain bikers. So we will just put this on. Um, I promise it's not actually that long of a clip here, although I seem to be having problems pulling it up. And... It's just a short two minute video. Damon, are we lined up on the screen there? Yeah, maybe just uh, full screen it. The... There we go. There isn't any sound going through. There's uh, no sound, Tara. All right. You, would... you might have to re-screen share. And then there's a little box on the bottom left that says share sound as well. This is my first time sharing a video, people. Can you tell on Zoom, if you can believe it? I had to do it yesterday. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, we're already a little bit uh, behind time. Maybe, maybe what I'll do is I'll just skip the video. And if we can figure it out at the end, um, we will uh, we'll do it then. So I'm just going to get back into, we are, am I back in presentation mode here, Damon? Yes, yes you are. Perfect, thanks. Um, uh, that's unfortunate. It's just it, it's uh, you can find it on YouTube. It is free. It's by Patagonia uh, and Brooklyn Bell. Uh, like I said, she's a really great uh, mountain biker and really talks a lot about inclusion and diversity within the, the mountain biking and, and how important it is to have that representation. But specifically what she talks about is the difference between inclusion and welcoming and how we can have a welcoming community. You can go to a trailhead that says welcome, welcome everybody. Um, but if we don't have the, the systems in place that actually address the inclusive integration of other people's and other perspectives, uh, we'll never actually reach that level of inclusion that, that we should be having in this day and age. So what can you do? Because I know Damon and I talked a lot about this uh, and maybe a little bit too high for some people. I, I can appreciate that it might be a little bit too academic or theoretical. Uh, but there is a lot that you can do and you're not actually um, you know reliant on anybody else because the first step that you can do is actually just educate yourself regarding things like microaggressions and um, understanding how you can actively seek out listen support and advocate for other people um, when i talk about microaggressions uh, again brooklyn bell talks about things like music choices at an event so often we have um, a classic rock kind of a music uh, genre or, or even a country music genre playing at, at some of these outdoor recreation sectors. But what does that mean for a person of color who wants to listen to something else? Again, it's that difference between welcoming and inclusion. Uh, one, one thing that came out in one of our interviews was the idea of the gender binary bathrooms, especially in an outhouse. Why do we need a gender binary symbol at an outhouse? And, and again, all of this is based on the presumption that you are going to um, stop talking and actually listen to people. Engagement is absolutely imperative if we want to address some of the inequities that we talked about today. At an organizational level, um, consider certain policies that you may be having and how internal policies may actually be preventing or limiting inclusion. You need to consider uh, adopting inclusion and diversity policies um to actually have a goal if you don't have that goal you will never actually make that goal so if you would like to have a more diverse board you actually have to say we want a more diverse board and then actively go out there 
We also need to consider about things uh, like communiques, internal or external, or certain pronouns being used, and, and how you can promote social justice movements as a participant and become an ally in various social justice movements. And lastly, at the government level, by government, I am speaking very broadly here, First Nations, uh, local and municipal governments, uh, provincial, territorial, and federal. Ultimately, it's really about breaking down and addressing systemic racism, anti-queer misogyny that exists within planning, within the police sector, justice, um, health, and various other ministries, along with your staff and, of course, all elected officials. It means actually adopting intersectionality and creating a vertical distribution process for decision making. It really might mean greater education, and it's also about learning how to identify and then also learning how to ask the questions to understand the issues. I am going to go to the next slide here uh, because like I said, I did set up some questions, but I did see the chat flying away. So maybe what I'll do is I'll stop the screen share for the, for the discussion section, CL, if you could help uh, moderate some questions. Yeah, hi, um, all right, to be honest, uh, I didn't see a lot of questions, but a, okay. a lot of it was uh, commenting. So okay. I think the questions are quite useful. All right. Well, I can pull them back up then, uh, if that's what people would like. Well, I don't know if that's what they'd like. I just that's just my opinion. <laughs> uh, please, everybody, if you have uh, if you have any questions, we would like this to be somewhat interactive and be able to address things. Um, and so, to get us started, you know, how can you amend your approach to active transportation, transportation planning, or outdoor recreation to address inequity and indigenous concerns? And then Damon, of course, is going to help me out here. Yeah, the, the um, yeah, we, we, uh, people need to type it into the chat, the way the okay. system is here. The, um, not too sure. Suzanne, oh, I, I do not understand the, <laughs> the binary system on outhouses. It just blows my mind as somebody who camps, hikes, and bikes, and, and I, I just it, it, it I, I, I don't understand it, it definitely came up as what's termed the, the microaggression how uh, you know and they're typically done in, in provincial rec sites right we just put them up and, and we you know allocate men goes in the, man goes in this one and a woman goes in this one and yet it, it's an outhouse people I think we can get over that um, the other question I thought would be worth talking about and considering is about equity issues in your community organization or workplace um, and what supports is it that you would need to improve the equitable access this could be in a personal level or an organizational level uh, or again maybe from your government and elected officials I believe there's uh, a panel coming up a little bit later with some elected officials we had a uh, Elizabeth Main elected official earlier today how what is it that we need uh, to do and what supports can we offer them okay it looks like we got a good challenging one okay and from guest no Oh, who? Amethyst, uh, what do you see are the barriers from a legislative perspective or otherwise that prevents Indigenous stewardship approaches to trail and trail building? I'm, I'm comfortable with answering this one. Um, so I, I would say the huge thing is the consultation process. Um, the provincial government, um, they kind of outline the the consultation process and um, there's kind of two different ones that I reviewed, which was the EA process, environmental assessment, and then also um, processes that involve a proponent. And so um, from conversations that I had with uh, a, a local kind of, um, I, they were, uh, I can't remember what they were in charge of. They were working in uh, West Bank First Nations and I was asking, you know, typically in terms of the the, the process for establishing a trail or establishing active transportation, like what would that look like? How would the government kind of come forward? And so she, she laid out those two processes um, of consultation and I was reviewing them. And it's just, it's filled with very colonial language. And, um, you know, it's, it's very much uh, directed towards individuals that are, are uh, educated um, you know, uh, have, have a degree and, uh, you know, very much that kind of university lingo, um, which, you know, might not always be understood. And then it's also just filled with, um, you know, like crown land and, and all these different terms that were used to facilitate the dispossession of Indigenous people. So um, number one, for me, 
um, is is to change that that uh, legislation surrounding consultation because the consultation process needs to be way more involved than than it is uh, currently, and it needs to be focused on relationship building. Um, it needs to be focused on you know like like I was saying through the work that Patrick does, Patrick Lucas. Um, who's a, a local trail builder. He's from Vancouver Island, but he does projects with indigenous communities throughout British Columbia and beyond um, uh, and, and does uh, consulting work as well. And, you know, he says, you know, we got to get the community involved. We got to go to those cultural events. You know, Ruth Adams, she just invited everyone to a, to a local cultural event when COVID's over. So um, if, if you're interested uh, as, a, as a proponent or, or a member of local government to kind of go um, to that community to approach them with a with a project you got to go to those events you got to speak to the people um, in order to identify their needs so yeah the consultation process needs to be changed and the environmental assessment process as well so that's that's the the basis of that so hope no, that answers your question yeah and I'd also like to, to add on there the other piece that we really that came highlighted out of the research too Damon uh, when you were looking into this was that you know we just don't have any indigenous um, trails advocacy groups they're like I said most advocacy groups are white male and wealthy and so we actually you know when we talk legislation it, it doesn't have to be legislated but there should be absolutely senior senior um, orders of government that are supporting the formation of uh, indigenous specific um, formed run um, and, and promoted uh, groups to to be addressing this you, and and I could say that across any other uh, equity group we need to ensure that those voices are loud and strong and heard so I just wanted to add that piece because that was very interesting there are none across Canada yeah for sure no thank you okay uh, we, oh here's <laughs> um okay Yeah, this is a down. We're we're actually tomorrow night. Um, we're we're actually gonna have a open squares, uh, virtual sharing, <laughs> and uh, we we um, that'll be at six forty five on Saturday night, and we could talk about a lot of this stuff there. I just don't see any other any more questions coming in on, on this format, Tara. Sorry. Oh, no, that's fine. I, I do see one here um, in relation to economic uh, benefits to communities. Uh, and I also just wanted to do a time check. I'm not 100% sure what time we, um, we we have until here. 15 minutes. Oh, well, we're, 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 okay. um, <laughs> we're, we're just um, people, unfortunately, are going to be leaving for supper here pretty quick. Yeah. Um, uh, but the question is there, is there an ingress here to start changing the language around land and land stewardship through specific community infrastructure programs? Well, and I think that's where the, the National Active Transportation Strategy is one. Um, I think the, the BC Active Transportation Strategy had an opportunity and, and I, you know, I recognize it's, it's, it's so easy to be critical. It's very easy to be critical. Uh, but the, the, the provincial one was, was new and, and the, the federal will hopefully learn from maybe some of the gaps that came from there. I am happy to say that CL and I were both had the opportunity to discuss this research to the uh, federal Active Transportation Strategy group and so hopefully some of these will be considered. And, and the one thing that I, I really wanted to emphasize was working with the communities. And again, you have to bring this down to a local level. You can't just have this top-down approach of, of the, the government saying, here's some money. Because again, if you look at a rural community, if you look like a, at a First Nations community, and they don't have the staffing available to apply for the funding, you know, it, it just continually goes to these wealthy communities that have access to it and, and can actually lead to, to forms of gentrification. Um, again, it, it goes into this whole city planning and, and land use planning type of thing. So I don't know if I'm actually answering your question here, but um, I do think there's an opportunity and I do think there, that, that COVID has also provided that opportunity for, um, for changing patterns and for recognizing the, how important it is to have walkable communities that are, are accessible, accessible to everyone. Um, Tara, do you mind if I share um, the infographic that was created? Oh, is it for, is it finalized? Yes, I would, that would be wonderful. Okay, well, here, let me just see if I could get good enough to um, 
share my screen then. <laughs> um, yeah, let me share. I mean, you know, if, if this is close enough to being my. So I, hopefully everybody could see that. If you guys could see it, then everyone else can. Maybe just talk a little bit about that. Sure. Is this, this is the second page. Can you go to the first page? Oh, um, well, I can, but I have to pull up another document. Okay. okay, no problem. So we'll just talk about the second page. Uh, there's a first page to this. Uh, I'm really happy to, to hear. I understood that it was in, in a draft form. It looks like it's really close to being done. So we do have the 30 or 40 odd page report available and it, sh it will be uploaded, I believe, on, on the web Trails BC website for those of you who really like to dig into details and, and read all those types of research. Uh, but we also recognize that uh, some people need that really high level and don't have the time to dig into a 40 page report. And so we've created a two page brief overview summary that sounds like it is very close to be completing. Um, Damon, perhaps you can talk about where it's going to be accessed if uh, that's been, it might not have been discussed yet. It might be a little bit too early. Oh, oh we're gonna make it available right after this as soon as everything gets finalized, so. Fantastic. There, you go. there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Sal. Um, so again, it's just this two-page summary of everything we talked about today, and like I said, and, and the report. And so hopefully you can take this and use this as uh, speaking notes, and you can go speak to your, your local trails organization, you can go speak to your local government, your elected officials, um, and, and just present this to them because it really does give that nice high level view. And then you know, feel free to, to go to the report if you wanted more references after that. Okay, so um, before we end, and there will be a dinner break, people don't need to sign out, they could just stay on if, if they want before the panel presentation tonight. Um, we've got a, another really good question. I'll stop my screen share. Sorry about that. And it's uh, coming actually from the trail specialist from Rick Sites Trails BC, Daniel Scott. And uh, he, he says, the Outdoor Recreation Council, which advises government on the recreational sector, has wanted to have First Nations representation on the Provincial Trails Advisory Body, PTAB, to provide an Indigenous perspective. The challenge the ORC has struggled with is the reality of so many different First Nations throughout the province. And how do you appoint a single individual or even a small group of individuals to represent so many different voices and nations at varying points in our nation's rebuilding. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna, this is, this is a biggie. Any potential ideas about how to address this on a provincial level? Yeah, so I can definitely take a stab at it, but I, I would love to hear Tara's insight on this too, because uh, this is definitely something we discussed quite a bit um, in terms of, you know, that, that question regarding how do we get an indigenous led trail organization? Um, and I, I just wanna start off like, just because I'm indigenous, I obviously do not speak for all indigenous people in Canada or British Columbia or even Kelowna. So um, this is my perspective and um, this is based on the research that I have done. And so a huge thing, uh, a huge part of it is um, to create a funding stream that is available for um, a, a trail advisory board. And, and you know, I, again, this is a lot of speculation. This is a lot of, of stuff that Tara and I have talked about, but just to have that funding available. So um, in terms of what that looks like and how we can get like full provincial representation from all these different nations, like I, I can't even remember. It, it's like over a hundred different indigenous nations in BC alone. Um, so it's, it's ridiculous to think that, you know, we're going to get representation from every single one, right? So um, in terms of what that looks like in that implementation, it's going to look a bit um, shaky uh, until, we, until we get that figured out. So um, my, my thinking is that, you know, we got to, the first thing we have to do is, ha is have that funding available. The second thing is um, we have to have Indigenous people working with Indigenous communities to deal with Indigenous issues. And that is a huge point. Um, a, to get full provincial representation, that might just be too big of a challenge to tackle at this point. Um, obviously, we don't want full representation from just the lower mainland to deal with issues up north. Like, we, that's not, 
it's not uh, feasible and it doesn't, it, I don't think that would be implemented well, but what we should have is, is probably more regional representation is what we should aim for. So, you know, whether that be kind of regional districts or um, yeah, to, to know the local indigenous issues. But uh, yeah, I, I think all, all in all, it's, it's a huge issue to tackle um, looking for that full provincial indigenous representation. So maybe first we should just have funding available um, and and make it so that indigenous people are dealing with indigenous issues. So that's my that's my piece. But I, I'd love to hear from Tara as well. Well, I the, the one thing I, I don't want anyone to take away um, is, is a feeling of helplessness. And and so I know when we talk about things like uh, yeah, in, increase your diversity and inclusion, and and you know sometimes people say, well, I I don't know what to do, and they get paralyzed. And so uh, we have to bust through that paralysis. And so it's hard. Nothing that we talked about is is easy um, but that doesn't mean that we can't work towards it and and i talked about diversity as a goal right you have to have a policy and a goal to address it so the out the orc i mean first thing i i, I mean i i know trails bc we, we presented something uh, a motion there cl you'll have to uh help recall exactly what it was but it had to do with adopting um, intersectionality as a decision-making process. It had to do with adopting the Truth and Reconciliation Report, and it had to do with adopting the M Murdered and Missing um, Indigenous Women and Girls Report. And so when we talk about internal policies that exist, you have to start with creating your own internal atmosphere and looking at what policies do or do not exist that might be preventing that. And so having explicit recognition that you are trying to address this would definitely be a first step. And adopting those reports would be a huge first step because ultimately we're talking about uh, you know 100 200 300 years of of relationship development that we're trying to compensate for and that will not happen overnight but if we don't start now and if we don't take that step it's we're never going to get there so don't be held back by thinking it seems impossible because you're never going to get i think you said daniel 198 nations is what he plugged in there damon no, you're not. You can, can you imagine running a committee with 200 people? Like you just, you can't. You're not going to do that. Um, but it, it's it's starting internally first, um, and, and stop asking an outside voice to fix your problems. You have to look at your own problems and identify where they are, and then go out and listen, and then go listen some more, and then go listen some more, and then maybe we'll be at a point where we can start. Um, tackling some of these issues. But the first step again is listen, listen, and uh, listen. Okay, well, there you go. And um, this, this, this uh, has been a very, very um, productive process, I think, with uh, Trails Society of BC. Um, we we realized that we uh, needed to take a different angle on um, how to move uh, active trails or non-motorized trails into the future. And, you know, somebody said yesterday about the silver lining about COVID and, you know, some of the things that have all changed in our culture since then. And, uh, you know, it, it helped give us the time to do this work as well. Um, we had started I remember being in uh, in Winnipeg at some here. I guess I should put on my thing. Sorry. Oh, I. <laughs> Sorry. That's I okay, see ya. <laughs> I, I I remember being in Winnipeg um, last well a year ago, February, and um, you know, getting these getting these grants in and. Yeah, so it, it, it does take a lot of time and for me to listen to um, Elder Ruth today and listen to, you know, um, her place and her ancestors place on the planet. Um, it just, uh, it's really good for me because um, it all takes time. Um, thank you very much, um, Tara and, and Damon, you have been just a diamond for us um, in helping move forward um, this work in the province. And on behalf of the board of directors, I, I really want to thank you. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I've had a blast doing this work. And, and one other little plug I wanna, I wanna give to Trails BC and, and how uh, we can take collective action and, and get something done is, I, I don't know if you realize CL, but uh, the Trail Forks app has been updated with indigenous uh, reconciliation. And so that is a, an absolute direct result of the webinar that was put on with Patrick Lucas and Tom Eustache that Damon referred to earlier. At the end of it, everyone said, what can we do? And so for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with Trails Fork, it's, it's an app about trails for mountain biking generally. And um, they, I guess they were inundated with emails and there is now an indigenous land recognition on the trails on Trail Forks app. And these are steps that we can all take. So that's what I really want people to be aware of and to take away that you don't have to, we're not, we can't just wait for our government to do something. We as individuals have to drive and push that change. And there are steps that we can do as individuals that can drive change at the organizational level, at the, at the local level, and at the provincial, federal, and territorial level. So thank you so much for having us, CL. Right yeah, <laughs> thanks, CL. Um, I I'm just feel so grateful and uh, so privileged to be able to, I don't know, add my voice and add my perspective to these issues. And um, yeah, it's just, it's really motivating to hear um, from all these other presentations and, you know, Elder Ruth Adams and um, Candice and, and Richard and all these other amazing people, Amithon, Caven. Um, it, it's, it's so great to see that there is momentum and, and you know, just because um, there is so much to do, like don't feel overwhelmed by it. Uh, like Tara said, you know, the, the key point is just to, um, you know, kind of educate yourself and do these, do these little steps um, in order to, you know, contribute to this positive change. And, and that's all we have to do is um, like the, the uh, Kootenai Adaptive Sports Association, there's, there's a part in the documentary where they said, we just got to stop doing things wrong. And that's, that's the start is we got to stop doing things wrong. Okay. Um, and so as long as you're not doing anything wrong, then, then we can keep proceeding. So make sure that, uh, you know, you kind of educate yourself on, oh, what might, what might I be doing wrong in terms of, you know, going out on the, on the land and um, to different trails and active transportation routes and stuff like that, but don't feel overwhelmed. Just, just make sure you're not doing it wrong. So that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so news is it's supper time. The bad news is that uh, you may not come back. <laughs> but um, if you do want to stay on for the next uh, uh, presentation, it's going to be a doozy. Uh, we've got um, Minister MP from uh, the Okanagan writing, Richard Cannings. On. We've got Bowen Ma, who's going to be presenting from uh, the, um, well, she's from North Vancouver, but she's um, the Minister of State for Infrastructure. Uh, we've got a counselor from the city of Kamloops, uh, Kathy Sinclair, who I've noted has been on, on a lot of these uh, sessions, which I really appreciate. Uh, and Janice uh, Levy uh, from Trails, Tra Trails of the Okanagan. Um, and Ellen Kidrat from Cycle 16. And both of those um, individuals, Janice and Ellen, working with First Nations to uh, you know, build uh, trails. So it should be a very interesting um, presentation and, and hopefully there'll be um, good um, uh, questions and answers. So you're more than um, free to stay online if you don't want to, if you do want go offline, we'll let you back in, no problem. But just want to say thank you very much for your attendance. And um, if you want to become a member of uh, Trails Society of BC, we would welcome you. Um, it's just trailsbc.ca and super easy. Um, we're upgrading our website. So you're going to see a change there. Um, and hopefully soon it was supposed to be done already. Websites go. And uh, yeah, just uh, Maybe get outside, get some fresh air, uh, eat something, and, um, pay attention to the natural world, and, and come back. A nice evening of uh, Friday night panel presentation. <laughs> okay, we'll see you soon. <laughs>